Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Shankle. I'm the chair of ANC2C, and I'd like to welcome you to our June 13th, 2023 meeting of ANC2C. Uh, this meeting was duly noted, noticed um, and published. Um, and we have um, a fairly um, decent agenda this evening. Um, and hopefully we will be able to move uh, efficiently uh, through um, our agenda this evening. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. Um, and we have four of four commissioners present. Um, so welcome commissioners. Um, and if we could just do uh, brief introductions, that would be great. Uh, again, Michael Shankel, the chair from 2C01, um, incorporating um, Chinatown and Penn Quarter. I'm Becky Strauss, 2C02, which is downtown K Street. Uh, this is Thomas Lee. I cover National Mall and Penn Quarter. Hi, I'm Kristen Rowe, 2CO4, which is downtown and city center. Awesome. Thank you, commissioners, for being here. Um, I'd like to quickly um, go through uh, tonight's agenda. The agenda is published on the ANC website at anc2c.us um, if you would like to, to um, access that agenda. Um, we have uh, first the approval of the agenda, uh, treasurer's report, um, and minutes. Uh, we will hear some community announcements from MPD, um, as well as the mayor's office, uh, council member Pento's office. Um, and then we will move into um, some local events that are impacting our community. We will hear about the DC bike ride 20. 23, um, and we will have a presentation from the downtown bed uh, on the pedestrian safety and experience study. Um, <laughs> we do have uh, one, um, sorry, this is no longer ABRA, my mistake, it's APCA license um, for um, HQDC house, uh, which will be um, proposed on 600 F Street. Um, we will have information uh, related to city center on the installation of some new uh, benches. Um, and then we will um, also uh, talk about um, planning, zoning, environment, and historic presentation, present, preservation, excuse me. Um, we have two uh, presentations and we will end this evening talking about an update uh, on the green court uh, Northwest uh, location and the transition uh, to um, a shelter uh, at this point. Um, are there any other additional items that we want to add to the agenda or that are missing? I don't think so. No. Uh, then, Michael? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, could you scroll down just a little bit? Could we, um, would it be possible to, uh, um, to uh, uh, trans, do, do the downtown, oh, scroll up a little bit more, go back up. Can we do the downtown DC pedestrian safety and experience study before we do DC bike ride 23? Um, I'd like to invite perhaps um, our local uh, liaisons and the police captains to you know participate in that discussion or be present for that discussion if, if possible. Sure, I'd be happy to make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other changes or additions to the agenda? Um, so I wanted to ask, cause I, I know I invited Christian to, to give a presentation and I see we have him here at the, the very end and Christian, I don't know if, if you would, would rather go a little earlier rather than wait until eight o'clock. Yeah, I would. I mean, my wife is out of town and my daughter, she's 11, she's at home. So the if the sooner I could go, the more I quickly I could get back to her. 
um, my mother-in-law is there, so she's not alone, but <laughs> you know, I, I, good thing. Good yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can, can um, we do that, Michael? Yes. Where would you like to put that at? Um, can you scroll up where are we? Um, can we go after the community announcements? That always goes sure. first. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Yep. I appreciate it. We'll put um, Kristen, Kristen, whoops, I have, have my other keyboard here, sorry. We will add it right before, um, is it Chris or Kristen? No, Christian, Christian, Chris. yeah. S-T-I-A-N, Caleri, C-A-L-L-E-R-I. Okay, awesome. Um, do I have a uh, motion to approve the agenda as modified? So moved. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, moved by Commissioner Rowe, seconded by Commissioner Strauss. All those in favor, you could raise your hand. I have three of three commissioners voting in favor of that. Um, one abstention uh, because I cannot see. <laughs> yeah. um, um, we do not have um, any uh, minutes to approve at this point. Um, we have, I believe, resolved uh, the issue with the minute taker and we will be getting our minutes shortly. Um, That's good. Commissioner Lee, do you have um, an update on the treasurer's report? I I do not. Uh, let me. Uh, I need to sit down with Federica and, and and clean up some some matters first. But I will have a treasurer's report next week. But I believe I sent out I, I, I issued checks for the for the minute taker, so that we should be good on that front. Yes, absolutely. Terrific. Awesome. Uh, we'll move forward under community announcements. Um, I see that we have. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Garvin with us this evening from MPG2. Hey, Mr. Shango, how you doing, sir? Very well, how are you? Good, and every hello to everyone that's on the call. Um, <clears throat> as far as um, our crime stats, um, we didn't have any homicides, um, no sex abuse. We did have um, four ADWs, which I'll speak on in a second. And our robberies are half and half. Um, burglaries went down, of course. I'll tell you why in a second. Our theft from autos are down. Our thefts um, are up. And our motor vehicle thefts are down. Um, first, we had an ADW gun, um, which was closed by arrest in the 1700 block of M Street. Um, we also recovered a gun, large capacity ammunition feeding device. And this individual was also a felon. So he was charged with felon in possession. Let me turn my radio down. I'm sorry. I'm the watch commander. Um, we had a stabbing in the 1300 block of New York Avenue, Northwest. Um, that case is still open, but we do have a bolo, which is um, a be on the lookout for um, of, the, of the individual, um, of the suspect. I mean, um, we had an assault, an ADW gun pointing, which was closed by arrest in the 1600 block of L Street, Northwest. We also had an ADW gun in the 1700 block of DeSale Street Northwest. Um, we had a robbery purse snatch, 14th um, and 8th Street, which was closed by arrest. Um, robbery, 1000 block of 16th Street. That case is still open, but we also have a bolo for that one, as well as a bolo for the 500 block of 11th Street Northwest. Um, we also had another robbery in 1100 block of 13th Street. And we had a burglary in the 1700 block of seven, I'm sorry, 1700 block of L Street Northwest. We have a bolo for that as well. Uh, we made a significant arrest of a Mr. Larry Fogel. Uh, Mr. Larry Fogel, um, we were able to connect him to 18 burglaries of establishments in the second district. He also um, committed burglaries also in the first district and committed four in the third district. So that was um, a big feat for us. Um, he was he was working overtime on us, going back to the early 
2022. So stores like um, Peruvian Connection, Johnston and Murphy, um, Zags, a couple of stores that I've mentioned in the previous calls, um, we were able to connect them to those establishments. So very um, grateful for that. Um, and the thefts are continuing to go up. Um, as I mentioned, um, some of our stores, again, like Macy's, um, Nordstrom Rack, um, Zara, we have people going in, they're grabbing merchandise and they're running out. Um, some of these stores, they do have um, SPOs, but they don't have any police powers and some don't um, do not engage the suspects. They just made the call to us, but by that time they've already gone or they've jumped on the Metro and made good of their escape. So, um, we'll can I ask a question about those? Yes. So when you say like Macy's or Zars, are you saying like every day? Are you saying like three times a day? Like what's the um, scale of the problem? Often. I'm saying often. Macy's um, has, again, Macy's has um, two or three different points of um, you, interests you can come in and out of, and they experience the thefts on a regular basis. I want to say maybe at least once, one a day. They, they are often hit. And how life. much money are we talking about? Um, the, last, the last I talked to the law prevention, um, he said they have lost um, hundreds of thousands of dollars I'm, I'm collectively, I'm, I'm sure, over the last year or so in merchandise. Um, what they try to do is they try to retrieve the merchandise from the suspect before they leave the store. Um, but again, that's not always safe either, because I believe that they are not armed. <laughs> They're just uniformed um, loss prevention employees. Um, so I always tell them just call us. It's, I mean, it's property. It's not worth it. Um, we don't know. Some of these people coming in, they have weapons. We're not sure. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they have good cameras, so we can just get pictures of them and put it out to the public, put it out to our um, neighboring um, districts and try to uh, make an arrest in a the case there. It, uh, I was uh, going to share something with, the, with everyone. I was walking home with my daughter, who's nine years old, um, from Thompson Elementary back down to Penn Quarter. And I happened to uh, walk past Macy's just as a bunch of kids were running out and jumping into a car. And I saw the loss prevention officer kind of like just secure the door after they had left. And uh, I was thinking of, I should get a photograph of the license plate, but then thought better of it because I didn't want to put myself in danger. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it, it was a little scary. Uh, oh yeah. My, my daughter mentioned that they were wearing black hoodies and face masks. So it was a little uh, disconcerting. Um, and uh, I, I would hate for any, anyone else to have come across that incident as well, but it was not uh, it was certainly not pleasant. And I feel for the merchants and the other people that are trying to get on with their lives and you know uh, trying to revitalize the downtown core. Right? This was not help, helpful in that in that effort. And to Mr. Lee's point, he's absolutely right. Um, the metro is literally right there, mm -hmm. so they can just run in, grab whatever's closest to the door, run out go down to the Metro and make good of their escape. Or they can just, there's a waiting car out there, jump in the vehicle and flee. It's not that far for them to get into, take 9th Street down. Next thing you know, they're in, Maryland, they're in Virginia or Southeast DC, so. Yeah. It, it also um, <clears throat> sounds like you guys have been doing an excellent job with the um, uh, a DWs um, and, and getting those um, off the streets and making arrests on those. And I think it's great that you uh, arrested the gentlemen that have been burglarizing numerous businesses um, in the area as well. So just kudos to you all and your success with that. It's great. Yes. Thank you. And the, the kind of, um, you know, what we're, what we're seeing at Macy's is this did not happen in, say, 2019. Is this really new? 
Um, I, I said it to get me some straws. So, so basically, like you know, this kind of criminal activity—it's new. Like um, Macy's dealing with this much loss every day. I'm not. I've only been here six months in this district, so I'm not sure what was going on in 2019. Um, but since I've been here and speaking to their staff members, um, this has been a regular um, thing for them, trying to cover all of these points of um, egress. Um, because I believe when one of the floors, when you go in, it's where all of the, the makeup, the fragrances are to the left, and then you might have some shoes to the right. But then if you come on the opposite side, um, I think you have some, um, just clothes and eyeglass wear. And these are things that you can just grab quick and just take off, take flight. How do we fix this? Like, how do we prevent this from happening? So right now we're working on a pilot plan where, um, I don't know if I could disclose this yet, but um, I hope to be able to put QR codes in places like Macy's. Um, Zara, some of the some of the establishments that are experiencing high thefts or flash mob thefts, where the QR codes are able to go into a designated place. And of course, the establishment has to agree to this. Um, we put them in there and then we have officers doing doing each tour, just randomly go in, scan the QR code. We'll know as far as managers, we'll be able to keep up track of this officer went in at this time, they spoke to this particular manager, mm -hmm. this manager is able to give feedback on what they possibly are experiencing. And I think what that'll do is um, it'll throw some of these, some of the criminal activity off guard because they never know when we will mm -hmm. pop up. They never know when a member is going to check in, um, get mm -hmm. out of their vehicles, actually go inside of the stores and um, engage the uh, store employees. Um so I believe that may, um, once that is, again, it's a pilot program, I'm hoping that we can push this out soon. Um, I believe that will help bring um, some of this criminal activity down. Um, any other questions for Lieutenant Garvin? Yeah, Lieutenant Garvin, uh, hi, my name's David. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, convey a positive experience I had uh, with MPD. Um, I'm not sure uh, that, that your sector is mine, you know, but, uh, you know, I'll give you credit anyway, if, um, you know, less is better to some uh, better to credit somewhere else. But uh, I called uh, I called the MPD non-emergency number uh, a couple of weeks ago, 28th, uh, 20th of May, I think, over uh, an individual who was smoking marijuana uh, outside. And, uh, you know, I know it's a, so it's not an emergency uh, call. And uh, so I know, you know, some may, people may think it's not a big deal or something, but I mean, crime begets more crime. And I was happy to see the, the MPD responded, responded quickly, uh, less than 15 minutes, came over, to, they, gave, they uh, gave the guy a warning and, uh, and he stopped. And, uh, and that was the end of the issue. The, the guys, uh, the police officers drove off, you know, so uh, Small uh, might might be a, uh, a small incident right there, you know, but uh, but that was a big improvement uh, for that day. And I think it, you know, it, it has effects down the road, too. So I want to appreciate and my cat agrees. Uh, so I want to just express my appreciation to you and the people in uniform doing what you do and uh, hope you keep it up. And thanks for that. Uh, that response. Absolutely. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. Small things will turn into big issues down the line. I mean, I, I live in Ward 6, so I, I, I don't know that I can really speak, but I mean, I'm not really, I'm just an invited guest to this one, but I just, I think it's really interesting uh, to, to wonder, like, if some of these things, particularly in Macy's, if, if the effectiveness of their escape goes down once people are no longer allowed to jump the turnstiles into the metro, you know, it's like, it's one of those things, if it takes longer for them, if they can't just leap over it and get onto a train, I wonder if that would and I'll blend well, some of this just yeah. as an idea, just as a thought. The folks I saw jumped into a waiting vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah. yes, but I think I, I do think that yes, uh, you know, for those that are are not coming in by vehicle, you know, um, having um, having better turn um, uh, fare evasion measures uh, would be uh, significant. And to that point, I think Brooke Pinto 
our, our councilwoman um, had a um, has a bill in front of city council um, that's that's trying to increase the um, the fines um, associated with fare evasion and 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 to make you know, police work more effective in in preventing very fare evaders from. Mm -hmm. um, um, so kudos to her. I just read about it in the paper today. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, thank you all for your comments. Um, we would like to just move forward to MPD uh, one um, and Captain Roth, who I saw um, on the call as well. Captain Roth. Hey, Commissioner, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so for 1D, um, you know, we're, uh, we're doing pretty good uh, over the last 30 to 60 days. Um, our robberies are up a little bit. Um, we've had five. Uh, but what I will say is, uh, comparatively to the other districts and sectors here in 1D, um, we've, we've done pretty good. Uh, we've been caught up in a couple of patterns. And, I, I, you know, I've explained pattern robberies before. We're in the similar MO, similar vehicles, similar lookouts. Um, so we got caught up in a couple of those. Um, but here in and around Chinatown, Mount Vernon area, uh, we only had one like that. It was a carjacking. Um, and they recovered the vehicle, I believe, over in the sixth district, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there's we're just waiting on some forensics to come back from that. And I suspect, um, you know, once we get that, uh, we'll be able to close out that case. Uh, we did have another robbery, um, the 300 block of Mass Ave. Um, we were able to track that car over to the 1200 block of North Capitol, uh, where we believe we found some of the perpetrators uh, personal identifying information. So uh, we'll be able to probably close that one as well. Um, that's the one good thing I will say about being here in the first district is we do have um, a, a pretty high closure rate uh, when things like this do happen. So uh, much higher than any other district. So, uh, you know, we we're, we benefit from all the cameras and stuff in, uh, in the area. So um, but what I will say about the Chinatown area is our arrests do continue to increase. Uh, we're working with Metro Transit and U.S. Park Police. They're um, helping us out significantly. Uh, but more importantly, it seems a lot of our arrests are starting to now get papered. And um, the courts are putting um, uh, stayaways in place. So now these guys aren't abiding by the stayaways. I'll just say that the uh, if you guys are up in Chinatown, I'm sure you know Officer Wong and Officer Davis. I think they locked mm -hmm. the same guy up uh, three or four times in the same week for violating um, his conditions of release. But, uh, you know, they know who these guys are. I was actually, I made an arrest the other day. I don't know if you saw that U-Haul that was parked on 6th Street. It was stolen. Um, I locked that guy up. Mm -hmm. uh, we found actually a significant amount, of, well, not a significant amount, but he had a vial of PCP on him as well. So he uh he was papered that case was papered and um he was given a stay away from chinatown as well so um I, you know like i said i think things are moving in the right direction uh, i think the overall area has significantly improved since the shelter is closed we still face challenges up on i street and in the park um but you know we're, we're gonna keep at it um my focus is not so much and I know that a lot of the complaints that I receive are around um, the homelessness, uh, the homeless issues. Uh, they're drinking and smoking in the park. And, and I understand that. Um, and I know that's annoying and we do enforce that when we see it. But, you know, these aren't the ones that are out robbing and shooting and carrying pistols and stuff. So I, I don't. I don't want to just target them, you know, because they're down on their luck or whatever. You know what I mean? Like drinking in the park. I get it. It's it's a problem, but there are bigger issues, I guess, that I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned with. So, uh, but again, we do address it when we see it. Um, the, the shooting that we had at seventh and H, the one that I put the email about, um, it was, a, I think back in the beginning of May, uh, there was a domestic violence case. Uh, we've arrested three people in that case. Um, mm -hmm. so that case has now been closed. Um, and as, uh, Lieutenant Garvin said, Really wasn't so much of a factor over here, uh, Mr. Larry Fogel, that, com that completed all of those burglaries. For whatever reason, he kind of skipped over the Chinatown area and went over to H Street Northeast, uh, mm -hmm. where he he did some damage over there. We we were getting hit um, pretty uh, pretty significantly over there. Um, but uh, like like Lieutenant Garvin said, um, 
be closed out and he, he'll be charged with probably upwards of 20 burglaries. So wow. uh, hopefully he'll uh, be out of the community for quite some time. Um, there was, we had an unlawful discharge. An individual fired a pistol up in the 600 block of K, I believe. It struck a, um, um, a, a park bench or whatever and did some damage but there was no um no injuries uh related to that uh we do have a pretty good lookout i passed that on to um our chinatown units the mount vernon guys and uh, our crime suppression team as well and then there was another unlawful discharge i think it may have been in the 600 block of i um officers i think heard some uh some gunfire when they got in the area um, they recovered some shell casings and saw some property damage. Uh, no injuries in that case either. Um, we did have a high hit uh, for someone who's under supervised um, release. So I suspect that that one, you know, there's some high solvability factors there as well. So I, 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 su I suspect we'll close that out um, relatively quickly as well. Um, and that's kind of kind of all I got if anyone has any questions for me. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, I just like David was saying earlier, I also um, engaged with some of our officers um, in Chinatown with uh, drug activity and they were right on it. And it was <clears throat> it was awesome. Um, dispersed the, the crowd um, that that had gathered that was gathered there. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. I did want to ask you about the uh, the death that occurred with the um, the uh, construction vehicles um, that occurred on, I believe it was Fifth Street or Sixth Street. Um, yes. is is there a potential arrest in this case, or is so? What I'll say about that is that they're similar to um, our homicide investigations uh, as as far as they get uh, investigated outside of the regular patrol or oh, gotcha. district detectives unit. So um, when whenever there's a traffic fatality, um, it gets investigated by. Um, oh, just our, our major crash um, mm -hmm. investigators. So I don't have uh, I can ask them for an update on that, but. From what I was able to gather, it just seemed like a horrific accident. Okay. Um, but I, again, I don't know that to be the case for sure. Got it. Got it. Yes. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for Captain Roth? Um, we have uh, Captain, one. I've got a question. Um, the, the the stairwells and the stoops along the businesses on H Street is that considered private property? Yes, if it's um if it's a stairwell going up into someone's house or into one of the businesses, then yes, that right. would be considered private. So you know, if if a, if a business owner said, "Hey, I've got a bunch of people like just sitting on my stairs," you know, would the police come and say, "Hey, guys, you have to, you can't sit here"? Yes, so both uh, that would be an arrestable offense. Um, if they are blocking passage into an area or blocking the sidewalk. So if they're like blocking the sidewalk where people are having to walk around in the street to get around them, I've mm -hmm. seen that up there or blocking um, the entrance to an establishment where people are trying to go and come and go, then those are, mm -hmm. both, they would fall underneath the disorderly statue. So those are both arrestable offenses. Um, where we haven't gotten a lot of cooperation is in the barring notice field. It seems like we get a lot of calls for people that just want us to come and clear the front of the steps, but then they, we, you know, when we leave, they come back and then we're, you know, we're constantly doing the same thing over and over again, where if we could get some buy-in from the businesses to actually issue barring notices, then when we come back, we can affect an arrest and hopefully that'll act as a deterrent um, for future activity. But, you know, for whatever reason, I know that there have been some business owners whose cars have been vandalized after they've called the police and things like that, but um, really, that's probably our most effective tool as to, to keep them off of there. And also some of those businesses up there um, have been shut down. So I don't have good contact information for them. So I tell the guys, I say, Hey guys, you can't sit there as private property. And, you know, for the most part, they move. Um, 
And then, you know, there are some businesses that have actually given them some permission to sit on their steps. So, you know, those are those are some of the challenges that we're facing in, in, in that respect. Great. Thank you. I have two questions. Question. Sorry. Well, go, ahead. Harold, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so, sorry. One last question. There is um, there is a gentleman that um, that that kind of like lies in front on the sidewalk in front of Walgreens at at the corner of the northeast corner of 7th and H. And he appears, you know, uh, intoxicated on a daily basis. Is that could, you know, could we work with, you know, law enforcement to, I mean, that's a very busy and congested corner and, and not that's a bit, people have to step over him. Could we work with law enforcement to, to, to get him to move somewhere else or, or get help, um, but not be at that intersection since, you know, there's a lot of convention goers that pass through the city and unfortunately they have to walk over this gentleman. Um, and uh, it's just not a great scene. Yeah, no, I, I know who you're talking about. Um, he is, I think a mental health consumer. Um, you know, the officers are quite familiar with him. Um, I, I understand that it's an eyesore, but again, you know, I would just caution, you know, being homeless and loitering is, are not crimes in the district. So Oops. I don't but, know. But if he's impeding really is. the public right of way, then don't I mean, have... he, he, he is, uh, you know, but, but not to the not to a point where you can't pass him on the side. I know exactly who you're talking about, but my thing is, I don't know if that's, I don't know if it would be appropriate for MPD. If, if MPD would be the appropriate agency, that might be more of a DBH um, type of issue to maybe offer him some help or maybe um, get him some on a treatment plan or something. But uh, to be honest with you, I don't think placing him under okay. arrest would okay. necessarily help him or, you know, ultimately he's going to be right back out there. So we've solved the problem for eight hours, but now we've just contributed to his plight. You know what I mean? So right. um, I think that that might be, there might be some space there for another agency to offer him some services outside of just, you know, arrest. Okay. So I'll reach out to DPH in the future then if I, you know, if I see him, you know, sprawled out on the sidewalk on that intersection. Yeah, I mean, if it, if, it, if it clearly looks like he's under the influence and need to be taken to the hospital, I think, you know, I'm not a medical professional. I think he has Tourette's and, you know, so he does, He you'll see him out there and he'll be, you know, he has a tick and he's barking or, but he's not, he's not, he's been, um, you know, from what the officers tell me out in Chinatown for, you know, way before pre-pandemic, I'm sure everybody that lives up there knows him. Um, and right, right. as far as I know, he has never been violent with anybody. He's more than happy to move along if you ask him to move along. Um, so, <laughs> you know, like I said, I don't, I don't want to contribute to, I guess. So you know. the, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but the gentleman that I'm talking to is not that, per I think uh, is not that person. This is a gentleman that always sits at seventh and H and he's, I mean, he doesn't have Tourette's, but he's, he is like, he's sprawled out on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. most like sprawled up on his back, maybe drunk, but, uh, but yeah, it's, and, uh, yeah. if he's under the influence and you can call us and we can get him to a hospital, um, I, you know, but that's essentially, I guess, the, the most involvement we would have, unless he's committing a crime. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two community questions. Uh, Howard Marks up first, and then um, uh, Dan Tier. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Schenkel. First, I want to give a shout out for uh, Commissioner Lee for raising the issue of the. Uh, actually, there's two people that sprawl out in front of the Walgreens. One, um, as, as as Captain Roth rightly pointed out, suffers uh, from. Uh, mental health issues, uh, Tourette syndrome, and when he has a catatonic attack, it's it's quite uh, shocking. He also switches down to the lower part of the metro state, the, 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 the mezzanine. He switches from Walgreens to the bottom of the upper escalator at the north end of the Gallery Place station, Chinatown station, where he camps out. And um, so there's clearly a mental health issue and thank you, uh, Commissioner Lee for following up. Definitely this gentleman uh, desperately needs uh, intervention, no question. So my, 
my uh, my two my two points I wanted to make with the Captain Roth. First of all, a big shout out for Captain Roth. We do see changes here for the better. I'm the vice president of the Residency Gallery Place Condo Board, 192 units. We have 300 people that live in our building. So right at ground zero regarding the social pathology that uh, besets us at 7th and H. Uh, but uh, definitely after the shelter uh, closed and my wife observed also, things seem to get much, much better. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you so much for that. And thanks for uh, the, the closeout rates. This is awesome that there are consequences for people who violate the law. That's all we could ask for, for from our, our, our public safety officers. So my first question is dealing, maybe you could hear it in the background, the buskers are back. They're back, including Jay Money, which is uh, sort of a euphemism. It's, it's two young children that, um, in my opinion, are exploited by their father or godfather who comes from Northern Virginia, drops them off at the G Street Alley, and uh, they, they put out a hit and the tourists and the office workers feel sorry for them, et cetera. But leaving that aside, so we have a, another busker that shows up now and plays after 10 p.m. This is particularly troublesome for us because there is a citywide noise curfew at 10 p.m. We have called in the past 911 for police intervention and the police have been great in shutting down these noise violators at 10 p.m. But sometimes we feel like, you know, police should be doing other stuff. You know, they shouldn't be out here. What, what should we be doing? I mean, should we call 911, Captain Roth, or could your own officers take the initiative and just say, go up to these people and say there is a noise ordinance and you, sir or ma madam, are in violation? Yeah, so what I'll say is it's kind of a tricky situation because I believe the courts have ruled that the buskers are what they're engaging in is protected by the First Amendment. So it's difficult for us to, you know, middle of the day, no noise at night law to go and say something to them. Um, uh, I can have a conversation with that guy. I see him up there all the time. I know who you're talking about. Um I'll have a conversation and see if we can't, you know, work out some some different agreement or arrangement or whatever. But yeah, I just, I just want to tread lightly because I don't want to, you know, violate uh, any constitutionally protected rights. So uh, after ten o'clock, now that's a different story. I've seen the guys up there; they play, um, you know, some of them play guitar, some of them play different instruments and stuff up there. Um, I've seen him up on Seventh and H a couple of times, but more I've seen him down on the other side. Um, but again, yeah, we can, we can do that. And I can put that out to the officers. Like, Hey, if you see the guys out here past 10 o'clock, um, you know, tell them to wrap it up for the night. Okay. Thank you. One, one very short question. Uh, acting chief Benedict has said that traffic enforcement is back mm -hmm. as a front burner issue. And just the other day we saw, uh, an officer of yours, Captain Roth pull over a motorist who turned who made an illegal right turn onto 7th southbound from H. Every, every, inter, every turn in our intersection is illegal and it's well posted and well marked. Still all day long, we have people, motorists who just don't care. Um, and could you tell us a little bit about what you're telling your men and women about implementing the acting chief's new um, um, orders regarding traffic enforcement. Yeah, so what I'll say about that is, and you know, I, I know that a lot of officers, probably myself included, are guilty of making a right-hand turn um, right there, uh, especially when you're trying to get through, there's an event going on. Um, so uh, as much as we can, um, you know, we try not to do it, but again, just that intersection is, um, I don't know if there's some space there for D dot to maybe start, uh, you know, put a camera up where if you make that right on red, then, then it'll flash you and give you a ticket. I think that that might help curtail some of the issue because we can't be up there at the whole time. Uh, but as far as the traffic initiative is concerned, yeah. So, um, 
the officers, you know, they were made aware like, hey, we're experiencing higher than normal motor vehicle thefts, more carjackings, more crimes with firearms and involving juveniles. So um, we're not out here to enforce traffic violations against little old ladies who are just trying to get to the doctor and back and forth. We're out here trying to do gun and drug interdiction, recover these stolen autos so they can't be used in other offenses um, and ticket um, individuals where appropriate. So, and again, that would be a perfect case scenario where, hey, it's marked, no no turns um, at the intersection. And so if we happen to see that, um, then we can enforce it. Uh, our enforcement strategy here in the first district has been, um, you know, a school coming to, a, to an end, this is going to, to change, but just keep in mind, uh, since we started the traffic initiative, um, we've had our traffic cars deployed around the schools until about six o'clock at night. And then we transitioned to the areas where we know we have our most crime. So Chinatown, uh, eight street quarter, then, then Navy yard. So, um, but yeah, so those are, those are, I guess the message, that's the message that we've been telling the officers is, um, you know, we can stop people for that. We're not really trying to stop somebody, give them a whole bunch of tickets. You know, that's not what we're out here for. It's not a stat driven game. We are keeping uh, track of who we're giving tickets to, how many guns we recover, all of those things. But um, there is no bounty or stats um, that we require them to come in. If they come in with no tickets, hey, that's fine. It's, it is what it is. As long as it's really about visibility, gun, drug interdiction, getting the stolen cars, uh, and the carjacked vehicles out of the community so they can't continue to um, to to reoffend. Um, and I hope that answered your question. It sure does. And thank you again for your service, Captain Roth. Absolutely. Um, David? Yeah, hi, Captain Roth. Uh, when I, I think you are actually the uh, the the guy whose sector uh, I fall in. So all the the credit that I gave to Lieutenant Garvin, I'll please share. You know, amongst yourselves, uh, the two of you uh, for one. Uh, and thanks, yeah, I'll take thanks all that credit away from him and keep. <laughs> um. Okay, um, I've got a question for you uh, uh, regarding nine one one calls. Um, uh, I live in the Pennsylvania, uh, where our mailing address is 601 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. However, that same address is shared with four different buildings uh, on the same block. And our particular building, you know, is really is on the Indiana Avenue uh, side of it, you know, as opposed to the Pennsylvania side. Uh, and so I'm wondering if uh, if your officers or if, uh, if your team there are aware, you know, if a 911 call comes in uh, to the building, that on our particular building, we're on Indiana Ave, Ave you know, uh, and, you know, out of concern, someone uh, won't have the presence of mind to try to direct you into Indiana Ave when uh, the address is Pennsylvania Avenue. You know, so I'll just take it from there. Uh, you know, are you aware of the situation? Yeah. So what I will say is that MPD and DC Fire, we're not in charge of um, the 911 call system that falls underneath the Office of Unified Communications. Uh, who they receive the calls and then they get sent to us. Um, but generally that hasn't been an issue. And if there is um, an issue concerning, um, you know, obviously in an emergency, you know, depending on what's going on is going to be, you know, all, more officers will be responding. But if it's just, you know, a run of the mill, like damage to property report, an officer shows up, he may ask the dispatcher to use what we call, you know, a callback. And then they'll call you back and then you can say, give them more information. Or when you call, you can just say, hey, we're on the Indiana Avenue side and that'll get put into the notes. So when the officer's responding, he can read the notes and it'll say oh, Indiana Avenue side. Um, I think it might have been you that actually mentioned calling 311. Uh, I just want to put this out there because you reminded me about it. 50411 is the text tip line. So if you have anything... Um, I saw somebody in another call that I was on earlier saying someone was checking door handles or looking into vehicles. If you see some suspicious activity like that and you don't feel comfortable calling or you want to remain anonymous or whatever, you can text 50411 and that'll come through our, um, our command information center and it'll get dispatched just like a radio assignment. So you can text, you can send video, you can text about whatever you want. Um, but yeah, so I hope that answers your question. If 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 the officer needs it, uh, they'll they'll probably just use a callback, and you'll get a callback from the dispatcher saying, "Hey, where exactly are you at?" Or can you come outside and flag the officer down, um, or the officer's outside with his lights on. So any number of things. Um, and then you know, if you give them the heads up prior to that, saying, "Hey, we're on the Indiana Avenue side," and they can come over there. Um, generally, 
they'll find you uh, relatively quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, keep up the good work and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And and David, I'm happy to give you a contact at Uniform Communications that has helped me with situations similar to that, uh, in which um, they couldn't find a street that was not in the maps or, or whatever. Um, it was an alleyway um, that they were able to get those mapped uh, for us. Okay, yeah, please, please do. Thanks, appreciate it. And most definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Lieutenant uh, Garvin and Captain Roth. Thank you. Appreciate you being here tonight. Of course. Um, we'd like to move to the mayor's office and Mr. Powell, I believe I saw you on here. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, how are you, Christopher? I'm well. I'm well. Awesome. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Chris Powell. I'm the Ward 2 liaison for the mayor's office. So I just have a few updates. So I'll see if I can share my screen here. All right. So I'll be quick. Um, first off, um, recently Mayor Bowser uh, launched her downtown action plan. The action plan builds on DC's comeback plan and sets specific strategies, programs, and initiative to reimagine revitalizing downtown. Uh, she's partnered with DEMPED and they're awarding a $200,000 grant, grant to uh, the downtown DC business improvement district bid, um, as well as a golden triangle bid and federal city council. And uh, the goal is to develop a comprehensive cross sector action plan for downtown recovery. Um, they're going to be having some monthly meetings, um, some community engagement and webinars, and I can post the links for more information on that for you guys, I think, or does the chat go directly to you and then you, Michael? Um, it is actually going out tonight to everybody. Okay. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to, but it is. <laughs> okay. I will um, post some stuff in the chat afterwards. Thank you. Uh, uh, next up, just on the topic of public safety, Mayor Bowser also recently announced a partnership uh, with DoorDash. Uh, they donated, uh, DoorDash donated $500,000 for a new uh, mobile camera uh, delivery uh, program. So rideshare drivers and food delivery services will have a chance to get a free uh, camera that they can install in their car. You just, I believe the only prerequisite right now is that you're a DC uh, resident and um, one of the, uh, and a driver for one of these services. So we, uh, we believe that will be a, a big step for public safety. And then some new appointments in district government. Uh, I have a new boss, uh, Richard Livingston, has been uh, named the new director of Mokers. Uh, he used to be a Ward 2 Moker. So uh, it's a well of knowledge for me. Uh, it'll be fun. As well as Sean Benedict was named interim chief of police. Um, Ayanna Bennett is named the new acting director for DC Department of Health, as well as Sam Abed is the lead department uh, of Youth Rehabilitation Services. Uh, some fun upcoming events. We've got the National Barbecue Battle. Uh, that'll be happening on June 24th and 25th. Uh, it's two days. There's going to be food, music. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, I plan on going if my wife will let me. Uh, as well as, uh, is today Tuesday? Uh, Thursday, in a couple of days here, we've got a Teletown Hall where we'll be like taking community input on the priorities for the next permanent police chief. Um, so everyone is encouraged to phone in with your questions, participate in the, I believe there's an online survey for that. And I'll also throw a link for that in the chat. And then just a reminder, if you'd like to meet with me or my partner, uh, we can do a community walk, have coffee, talk about issues where you're available. Generally, we can make time, but uh, the best days are Tuesdays and Fridays for um, just community engagement or if you wanna do infrastructure style walk. This is the contact information here as well. 
Um, and I also have some extra tickets to the barbecue battle that I wanted to give away. I'm not sure the best way to do that if maybe like the first three people that uh, email me or if you can direct message me in this chat, um, I can uh, coordinate to get you guys some tickets to the barbecue battle for Saturday, just Saturday. Um, but that's about it. I appreciate uh, the time, guys. That is great information. Uh, we appreciate that very much. Um, Chris also um, uh, recently helped uh, with a clothing issue at the uh, Fat Handy Shelter, oh, the yeah. legacy oh. site, a couple of weeks ago um, and addressed that. I... Um, I uh, I don't um, I appreciate your your work with this and um, I appreciate that it getting cleaned up as quickly as it did. Um, I will say that I feel as not from not from your response, but I just from a city's response that I feel like the agency directors just like oh it's a contractor issue you know it's taken care of now um and this perpetually seems to be an ongoing issue um with with um you know d uh, d uh dhs um etc so um that is something that we're really striving to to ensure there's more accountability um on their part and even the response from uh deputy mayor turnage i was kind of like oh wow yeah oh it's taken care of you know <laughs> instead of like we're gonna get to we're gonna figure out what happened here where the breakdown happened um and what occurred but i do appreciate you very much for jumping on that and helping me on that saturday thank you um i appreciate that and i know part of like my role here or my like targeted impact is, you know, to help us be a little more uh, proactive than reactive, like you said, and, and sort of identify some of these issues or these shortcomings to prevent them from happening again. Um, but I know on the plus side, I did have some, um, maybe two, two weekends ago, or the, some positive um, uh, interactions with some Chinatown members involving, uh, I think, two different occasions of illegal dumping or alleged miss pickup and I had you know just really good um really good time working with like my DPW core team they really stepped up and were able to just get some stuff done really quickly over the weekend as you know getting stuff done over the weekend with government agencies is never an easy thing um yes but yeah we're trying so we're out we're out here trying awesome thank you very much commissioners do you have any questions for the mayor's office Right. Um, um, just thank you for your presentation. I, I really enjoyed the updates as to you know what's happening in the city. Can you hear me? We should do this Hello? more in the future. Hello. Yep. Can you, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, okay. Great. Yes. I I just said something in the chat. I oh, I'm sorry. Sure how I raise a hand. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Deborah Friedman. Hello. Um, this is the first time I came to a meeting like this on Zoom. Are you going to be going one? Are you going to be going back to live meetings, or do you seem to get a better uh, cross section of people on Zoom? That's one question. I can't hear you. There, I was on mute. I'm sorry. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are going back to live meetings. Um, I do not. Um, that will be this fall. Okay, that we'll great. Be doing that, um, we do get a great cross section of folks that have participate via Zoom. Great. My uh, my my next question is: um, Hi, Thomas. It's uh, I'm Debbie Friedman, and I was wondering who's working on bringing. Uh, I'm in Penn Quarter, uh, bringing back business to Penn Quarter. Um, we're really hit hard by not having that CVS. Be great to have a convenience store there. Be great to have a small grocery store there. Uh, 
I just was wondering, I know I did go to the opening of um, the mayor's um, um, Bring Back Washington or whatever it was called, and it was well attended. And I loved what they what they have done there in that area with putting little sidewalk um, uh, seating for people to sit on and enjoy with art and whatever it's decorated. I'd love to see that happen here in Penn Quarter. I'd love to see that um, beautiful painting that we had many years ago of the stripes is that Gene, I forget his name, that went up and down from the um, National Gallery of Art down to down 8th Street. That'd be a wonderful, beautiful kind of thing to bring people back to the city. We used to have, I just talk, 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 and then I'll stop. We used to have the, the farm market, which was really well, huge and well attended when it was on, um, was on 8th Street. And now that it's uh, in front of the national, uh, in front of the portrait gallery, it doesn't seem to have very, very much play. Is that because we're not good customers? Is that because the community itself doesn't, you know, buy into it? Because we really need to do something more proactive, or we're going to have nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'll leave that for all of you to to answer. I just want to see a revival here um, on the Penn Quarter. It seems to be very revived down at the wharf, very revived down at the um, um, at the stadium, uh, the baseball stadium. And I was just up on 14th Street or on 16th Street. We just don't seem to have the vibe, except for, as was pointed out earlier, the um, not so great attraction around Chinatown with the the homeless and the, the young kids that are dancing there for people and for money. I try to avoid going up that way, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm from Council Member Pinto's office, and I would say that downtown revitalization is actually um, one of her central priorities, um, which I think can also be demonstrated in the budget that we just passed yeah. um, in partnership with the mayor, uh, especially to reactivate and revitalize our downtown spaces. Um, as you know, Penn Quarter in our downtown is primarily filled with uh, office spaces which were uh, made vacant through the pandemic. So finding ways to incentivize both office to housing conversions, um, bringing childcare centers downtown, incentivizing retail and restaurants and multi-use corridors is a huge priority. So I would also encourage you to reach out to our office if you have any specific ideas for, um, I think you mentioned some. What was your training. office? Because we do have a lot of apartments here, a lot of people living here. Mm -hmm. That's what I, that's, I'm surprised by that. If you take a look at the, the Landsberg, the Clara Barton. Um, Absolutely. 701. I mean, we have a lot of people living down here. I didn't even name half of the places. So. And there certainly are a lot of residents, but compared to some of our other um, denser corridors, there are fewer residents in um, most of Penn Quarter. And so that bringing our workers back downtown and also making it a destination for both residents and visitors um, will help, I think, to revitalize those corridors. I'll send you my chat information yeah. soon. I know I'll also be speaking, um, but Chair Schenkel, I seem to only please. be able to send messages to you. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Please, um, please uh, Victoria, go ahead. And, and what was your name there. again? Um, uh, could you just, what an office, what you, what office were you in? I kind of jumped in. Uh, Chris, if you have anything else to add, I'll maybe let you finish and then I'll give my spiel from council member Pinto's office. Pardon for jumping in. <laughs> Christopher, do you have other things that you'd like to add there? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so council member Pinto's office. <laughs> we have uh, Victoria sending, uh, standing in tonight um, for our uh, representatives. So good evening. Good evening. Um, and at the end of the chat, I'll share my chat um, contact information as well. Um, so you can see that momentarily. I'll share my screen. All right. You're all working from home, I take it. Uh, definitely where it was in the office today, as I know Chris was out in the community as well, um, but back home for this meeting. Good. All right. Um, 
All right, so good evening, everyone. My name is Victoria Costarubias. I work for Council Member Pinto as her uh, scheduler and community coordinator. Um, I'm really grateful to be here with you tonight, filling in for my colleague, pa Pablo Velasco Rodriguez, who typically um, is your liaison for ANC 2C. So just to start off, um, I wanna share a couple of events around the downtown neighborhood. Um, where Team Pinto and the council member have been frequenting. Um, on the left here, we can see a photo from the kickoff of the downtown action plan that Chris mentioned a little bit ago to talk about uh, opportunities for activizing and revitalizing our downtown corridors. A couple weeks ago, we, the council member also spoke at a Bike to Work Day, where we had a wonderful gathering of folks um, from all across the city and some folks coming in from Maryland and Virginia. Uh, in Franklin Park, um, which is blossoming and beautiful right now. I don't know if you guys have spent any time there lately. No. And then two weeks ago, the council member also spoke at an event with the Trigger Project, um, which works to bring awareness to gun violence prevention measures in the district um, and finding ways to partner with both our uh, public and private and com community-based organizations to try it and um, bring awareness as to why the trigger might sometimes be pulled. And then this last weekend, as I'm sure you're all aware, we had a wonderful pride parade, which did not necessarily hit downtown, but I'm sure that many folks were there and Team Pinto was there um, in full stride and full pink. And then this morning, uh, the council member spoke at an event um, for the groundbreaking of the largest lease of 2023 to be signed um, by a public, uh, sorry, by a private firm. Uh, which is super exciting um, and will hopefully bring even more workers downtown. Where was that lease? Uh, it's at What's 600... the lease for? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's at 605th Street, um, so right across from the National Building Museum and just inside mm -hmm. the ward boundary. Um, but uh, the largest anchor tenant is with Crowell, which is a, a law firm. Um, and Metro uh, is also on the ground floor of that building, is my understanding. Yes. Um, so I'm sure that you all are a little bit tired of hearing about the budget, but super exciting today, the council held their final vote of the fiscal, 20, fiscal year 24 budget today. Um, we'll planned on sending every single A and C a list of the final budget numbers for projects in your area. So we'll be on the lookout for that. And that way I also don't run through all of the budget items tonight. <laughs> Um, we are already taking fiscal year 25 requests, so if you have anything that comes top of mind or maybe didn't get addressed in this budget, I recommend that you reach out to our office. Um, early communication helps to get the plan rolling quickly. Um, I have a question about the budget real fast. So does Congress now have 30 days beginning today to approve? I admit that I can't remember if it's 30 or 60 days for this budget, um, but there is a review period, um, first by mayoral review uh, for, I think, 10 days, and then 30 or 60 days for Congress to review um, this budget. Okay, but that started essentially today, not May 30th? It's because we have to go through okay. multiple votes before something okay. we move forward. Um, and as she was throughout the entire budget process, Councilmember Pinto continues to be focused on improving public safety. The Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety will hold a public hearing on Mayor Bowser's proposed Safer Stronger DC bill on Tuesday, June 27th at noon. I'll post a link with instructions on how to sign up to testify and the full text of the bill in the chapter. I finish with these announcements. We're also rolling out other public safety legislation like the Metro Safety Bill that some folks mentioned earlier today, uh, which the council member introduced last week that would enable civil enforcement of Metro fare evasion. In 2018, the council changed fare evasion from a criminal offense to a civil offense, recognizing that people should not be involved in the criminal legal system for a low dollar offense. That unintentionally left WMATA without an enforcement mechanism, and WMATA has stressed the correlation between fare evasion and more serious crime in the metro system. We know that many people need more support to afford writing, and she will keep working with her colleagues to make metro more affordable. 
She also sent a letter to various agencies asking them to streamline the process for disbursing kids' ride-free cards to ensure that more kids get Metro cards in their hands. Um, sorry, <laughs> just got a little bit lost here. Um, but additionally, the council member recently uh, toured the Department of Forensic Sciences, um, which you can see in this top photo here on this slide. Um, where she spoke with Director Diaz about how critical it is that the lab get reaccredited to make sure people are being held accountable for crimes. And we're confident that they're heading towards uh, reaccreditation in the coming months. That's all for me for now. Um, we encourage you to sign up uh, for our newsletter at brookpintodc.com. Um, this comes out about once a week, every other week with updates from our office. Um, and then I'll also post my information in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you uh, very much for the update. And um, just want to applaud both um, Chris and you for using a PowerPoint tonight to uh, to overread your topics, which I think is, is great. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I'm glad you brought this up was the Kids Ride Free program. And I know that we have my colleague and I, as we, we go to work every morning, we leave the building at the same time, we're actually surprised with um, all of the school aides kids jumping the turnstiles um, instead of paying. And I think that this just perpetuates um, a situation in which people are going to continue to jump the turnstiles over, over time. Um, so I do applaud the expansion of that Kids Ride Free program, which actually provides um, a Metro card for um, individuals under 21 who are in, in, uh, in school, a public school um, in DC, which is amazing and fantastic that that is even an option um, that's offered. So thank you for that. Um, Commissioners, do you have a questions for Council Member Pento's office? Um, what are the chances of Pento's um, very evasion measure, prevention measure, getting past the city council? Sorry, it was a little hard to hear. Did you ask the likelihood of her bill being passed? Yeah, exactly. Her very or um, however way you phrased it, that her her measure to reduce fare evasion. What's the likelihood of that passing through city council in your in your political opinion? I don't know if that's necessarily a question I could answer today, um, but I know that this is certainly an issue that um, the council members worked closely with uh, the GM of Met of Wamada, Randy Clark to try and figure out opportunities for um, addressing this issue. And I think as Chair Schenkel mentioned, um, making sure that we're focusing on the agency coordination to allow folks um, to be aware of the option to get a free Metro card, for example, is super important as well. Um, so we're hopeful that um, we'll be able to see improvements to the enforcement of this civil offense soon and we'll hold a hearing on it again coming up as well. Thank you for that. Um, I, I did give uh, fellow commissioners the ability to post uh, things in the chat. I'm sorry about that. I thought <laughs> I thought it was turned off, but it is actually turned on. Uh, so um, so uh, chats are coming just to to us as, as commissioners. So we're happy to distribute that, Victoria, the, the links to you. Thank you. I'll send those right now. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Um, and um, just uh, two pieces of update. Um, I did participate in uh, Council Member Pinto's um, convening of the Ward 2 chairs, which happened. Um, Last week was it last week? It seems like time it seems so long ago. <laughs> all blurred. Uh, mm -hmm. Last week, in which we got together and talked about um, challenges impacting each of the ANCs in Ward Two, 
all the chairs were present for that uh, lunch meeting, which was fantastic. And uh, of course, public safety was the number one uh, concern that kind of emerged uh, from that meeting, um, wanting to uh, really work to, to codify that. Um, and also to let individuals know, um, following last month's meeting, um, we did send a letter uh, to the United States Attorney uh, for, the District of, for the District of Columbia, Matthew Graves, asking him um, to uh, conduct more enforcement um, downtown of crimes and, and papering, I guess, of, of individuals who have committed offenses um, because of a reluctance, a reluctance that we believe to prosecute. Um, and we have invited him to participate in one of our upcoming meetings as well. So just letting community members know that as well. Uh, we have one question uh, on the floor and that's to Howard Marks. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Victoria. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Council Member Pinto for the uh, legislation, uh, proposed legislation she introduced or legislation she introduced regarding Metro fare evasion. Um, it already has, uh, someone asked what support. Uh, Chairman Mendelson is a co-sponsor, original co-sponsor of this bill. Um, and uh, there are uh, uh, there are one other co-sponsor uh, that, uh, I would say that one of the arguments that was raised as to why Metro fare evasion was decriminalized was that there was a disproportionate uh, a number of blacks that were arrested by Metro police for fare evasion. Uh, there was a report that was done. The council overreacted, uh, thanks to uh, council member Charles Allen and uh, decriminalized uh, Metro fare evasion. Just anecdotally, yesterday, I saw two young white women also jump the fare gates at a DuPont Circle. And then the same day, there were like three white women in their 20s that did the same thing here at Gallery Place. So that, and, and Chairman Mendelson has made it quite clear, this is not a racial issue. So thanks again to council member uh, Pinto for in, in introducing this legislation. I think it's just important to um, emphasize that we still support the, um, decriminalization of fare evasion. I think that's super important and the council member is absolutely in line with that. Um, we just think that it's also important for um, there to be enforcement mechanisms in place when there is a civil offense um, on our law books. And so that's the purpose of this legislation is to enforce a civil offense, um, not at all to bring this back into the space of a criminal offense. So I just wanna make sure that that delineation is clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, very clear. Thank you. I understand the delineation, but was there a big problem that required this remedy um, a few years ago? Like, it seems like it's caused more problems than it's really solved in our society. I, I had to take my daughter to school the other day, and and she saw some fairy vaders, and she's nine. And she looked at me, and she's like. Dad, what's going on? And so how do I explain that to my daughter I'm trying to raise in the city? It seems like it seems like we're causing more problems in our society than we really saw. But anyway, I'll, I'll let you. So one concern, I think, is that um, Metro has or WMATA has estimated that um, fare evasion leads to a loss of $40 million in revenue, which is obviously quite significant. Um, and so this is also, again, a mechanism to try and um, enhance revenue, which will Im improve services for all folks and for all riders um, on WMATA's Metro. So that's another thing to keep in mind with this offense. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate you being here tonight and, uh, and providing the update. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to uh, local events that impact the community. And first up, uh, Commissioner Strauss, would you like to introduce uh, um, the next topic for us? Sure. Uh, so Christian Kaleri is uh, an architect. Yes. 
Yes. Designer, ur yeah. urban designer. Okay, architect oh, yeah. at, <laughs> at Perkins Eastman, uh, which is, uh, it's the firm that designed the wharf, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so their office is located at One Thomas Circle, which is not far from Green Court Alley. Um, and um, I think it's, it's more or less official. Department of Human Services owns the old balanced gym building and they intend to make it into some kind of shelter. We don't know when exactly, um, but I think that um, ANSI commissioners uh, for TUSI all agree that maybe we could improve the alley and activate it more, make it a friendlier uh, community oriented space. And uh, Christian, Kristen and Nancy Groth and I, uh, we walked through the alley and talked through the potential, the opportunities. Uh, and uh, Christian um, has offered to give a very brief presentation uh, about those opportunities and how to approach um, yeah. approach it. Mm -hmm. Go so ahead, Christian. I, I, hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here. Um, uh, so my name is Christian Caleri. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a Ward 2 resident. I'm a Ward 6 resident, but I work in Ward 2 every day. <laughs> so um, it's very interesting for me to hear uh, this conversation because my daughter goes to Basis DC, which I, I think must be in this ward as well. Um, it's just a, I mean, so I'm here all the time, right? So it's, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to give a talk, um, sort of an academic talk that I recently, I'm, this is a much shortened version of an academic talk that I gave uh, to the AIA Urban Design Committee recently. Um, and so I've cut it down, like way cut it down. And then I've, I, I want to show you a few drawings that I did and just a few pictures just to get you thinking about the potential of the alley that you're in. Okay. So um, it will be kind of academic in nature, and I hope that is okay. Um, the first part of it will be anyway. And the reason for that is because um, as an architect and as an urban designer, I am a very strong proponent of the power of ideas in that the way in which we look at a problem and the way in which we look at cities and how people live with one another um, is, uh, is fundamental to the way we approach uh, solving problems and the way we approach designing things. So can everybody see my screen? Okay, so I'm gonna go through this. You can, you're good. Yes, on the you can yes, see my screen. We can see, okay, yes, we can wonderful. See okay, so again, I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit of theory before I get into this. Um, every time we think about something, we have to wonder how we relate to what came before us. Um, so, how do architects and urban designers relate to the past? There's really two ways: you can ignore it and eliminate it, or you can embrace it. Okay, so um, just a couple visual versions of this. If you've been to Chicago, Illinois, and seen what um, has been done to the old soldier field, this is a wonderful version of how to ignore the past. I think it's, an, it's a horrible piece of architecture. Um, and I think it's a real shame what has happened here. But the, there's an attitude behind this kind of decision making. Um, and it's one that I'll get into in just a second. And the opposite of that is really the notion of embracing the past. So if you've been to Paris, I doubt very highly you've been to the Arend de Lutece, which is on the left bank. It's actually an historic um, old Roman amphitheater that has been absolutely incorporated into the fabric of the neighborhood and is a place where people play soccer and where you know there's community theater and that kind of thing. It's not a thing that people who visit Paris know about, um, but it's a really wonderful way to not eliminate uh, not eliminate the past or not ignore the past. And so I want to talk about the attitude that go goes into these two kinds of decisions. So there's a there's a there's an architectural theorist named Carol Burns um, <clears throat> who wrote uh, once about the cleared site versus the constructed site. And these are two different ways in which we can, can conceive of a place before we do something to it architecturally or urban design wise. Um, so there's the first idea is the notion of the cleared site. What is the cleared site and how does it manifest itself? The cleared site is an attitude where you feel that a site is, is void of any content 
Um, and therefore, there's no constraints on what an architect can do. Nature doesn't count as content or context, nor does the past. Okay, so the site is is seen as very unoccupied. Um, this is the modernist view, um, going back to a guy particularly named Le Corbusier. Um, and this is a time-based idea. Um, in architectural circles, we refer to this as the notion of the zeitgeist. It tends to fetishize technology. And the, the solutions that are applied tend to be global and not localized, okay? So this is the kind of architecture that comes from that. This is a house designed by Le Corbusier. What I want you to see is I want you to keep this picture in your mind, and I'm going to show you another house built at the same time um, that is a very different kind of approach to its site and to uh, the history of that site. So this is in France. This is outside of Paris. You'd notice that it's just a, cle a cleared out site, right? And they plop this object building right down in the middle of it. This same architect also had a plan for Paris um, in, the, in, the, in the early 20th century where he proposed to eliminate most of the urban fabric of the historic city um, and replace it with uh, tall towers. Now I'm gonna show you a picture that is not real, but it's what it's an illustration of what this would have looked like. And um, so here's Paris and here's what his design proposal would have looked like. Now you'll recognize this as being a rather common site in American cities. These ideas were brought to the United States um, and much of our public housing was based on the ideas of Le Corbusier. But this attitude that the people and the place and the history don't matter, the only thing that matters is the clean slate, um, that, is the, that is the nature of the cleared site mentality relative to urbanism. The opposite of that is the constructed site. So what is this and how does it manifest? Um, the constructed site is, um, it, it's seen that the site as you find it is has content, whatever that content might be. Um, therefore, there are constraints on what an architect or urban designer can do. Um, nature is seen as content and context. So are people, so is our past, um, and so is the built world. The, ar the architecture that we see in a place is considered context and content. Therefore, the site is seen as occupied, okay? This this is the pre-modernist view. Um, this view tends to be place-based. Um, this is why you can look at a row house in New York and look at a row house in Washington or one in Baltimore or one in San Francisco and tell them all apart. This is a place-based approach to thinking, design thinking. Um, it, and it tends to be localized, therefore, and not a global solution. Um, and so when we look at Falling Water, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, um, at the same time as that house by Le Corbusier, you see a completely different attitude towards the site, right? Um, what you can see here is you can see Franco Wright, this is southeast of, of Pittsburgh. Um, you can see that the house in every way is intended to embrace this notion of the site. The same thing happened here with the Capitol building. The Capitol building was designed by seven architects over the course of 200 years. It's actually still being built, but it all hangs together because what came before was, was valued. Um, and it was seen as important and worth preserving. Um, you can also see this in the idea of adaptive reuse. Um, this is a, a museum in Minneapolis. Um, it's a history of milling in Indianapolis and or in, in Minneapolis rather. And uh, you can see that the architect inserted a building into this old ruin of a burned out mill as a way to give some verisimilitude to the notion of a piece of architecture that has to do with the very place in which the thing is being built. And so there's various ways in which you can embrace your site and embrace the past um, and embrace the people that made that history. And so it's really, really important, this notion of people, this notion of history, and this notion of treating people with dignity and treating their histories with dignity. Um, so it just now, I'm not going to talk about me much. This is my approach as an architect and as an urban designer, where I really sort of embrace this notion of the constructed site. And there's some Latin up there. Genus loci means spirit of the place, as opposed to zeitgeist, which means spirit of the time. Most architects fall into one of these two categories. I happen to be in the former. I really believe in the spirit of place as being an important driver to how I think about places. Um, therefore, I think place is more important in the moment in history in which we're designing. And therefore, when I think about cities, I really feel that cities above all else are for are for people are for human beings as opposed to the technology imposed upon cities in the 20th century which is the automobile the automobile is a destroyer of cities but i believe that if you make places that people love i'm going to just show you some designs of mine um, places that people will love um, in a manner that people will be willing to defend um, with architecture that refers to their humanity and not the building's technology these are two buildings that i've designed one on the left just got built at catholic university and the one on the right is being built now, not too far at Macmillan. Um, and if you treat human beings and their lives with respect, um, that the public then will fight to preserve our ideas, um, both as people involved in the political process and as designers, and rather than cheer the destruction of our ideas. So this is in St. Louis, Missouri. You can see this is a built version of some of those ideas I showed you earlier 
um, by Le Corbusier in Paris. And this is probably the most famous photograph of this place. Um, people ch cried with joy when this was ripped down. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. Here's a local example. Um, the church on the left was designed by a very famous architect named I.M. Pei. Um, it's now destroyed and this is in its place, but nobody raised a finger really to preserve that building yet. When you look at the right, um, people in Washington will fight tooth and nail to save every facade from the 19th century. And we need to understand why that is. It's because those places have something to do with place rather than a moment in time. And therefore, when we talk about the technology of the car, um, uh, the manifesting that technology is the primary driver of design ideas in our cities um, is can be seen as an act of, of totalitarian control over the lives of, of the people that live in a city. And it's very often devastating. And there's a lot of talk now about how we still incorporate cars into our public spaces. There's a lot of talk about redesigning cities to incorporate um, driverless cars. And to me, this is all very silly um, because the only thing that you can accurately predict about this world is the behavior of people. And, and I think if we consider the human being first and what makes life beautiful, what why we all choose to live in cities. Um, it has nothing to do with the convenience of an automobile. It has everything to do with the joy of living with other people and the beauty that comes from the collective act of living together. This is um, the Quarf. This is a project my office did. Um, here's a design of mine. I was the design architect for Macmillan. I know it's very controversial, but I was the primarily the architect of the community center, which wasn't all that controversial. Um, and this was very, the history of this place was really incorporated into everything we did. I'm not going to get into the project, but I'm also the architect of this new dining hall at Catholic University, um, which was well received and has everything to do with extending what's good about that place and respecting the people that live on that campus and will use it. So that brings me to this. This brings me to the alley that we need to talk about. Here it is, um, the block in the middle. And when you look at that, you might say, okay, what are we looking at? That gray, the gray area in that block, that's the public right of way for the alley, okay? Um, and this comes right from the GIS uh, that's publicly available. That building there in blue, that is the building in question that is gonna be turned into a shelter, homeless shelter. So I was asked um, to just take a look and to come up with some thoughts about how we could approach this. And so when we walked through this the other day, Becky and I and a few others, um, what I talked about was basically a real condensed version of the condensed thing I just talked to you about, this notion of, um, of approaching a place as having content and having history and the act of respecting what came before and the act of respecting the people that live there um, and, and how you can make a place humane. If you've been back in that alley, you know, there's no there's no place there, really. It's very interesting. This there's right here. There's an old bar um, and this was the old gym. And this alley here is quite pleasant. But much of it is just kind of buildings that come right down and the, There's really not a whole lot going on. But what would happen if we reconsidered what happened in this yellow area? OK, so that's some public space that you know we can do things with. Um, I understand that we need to have access by trucks and like, you know, trash trucks to get back here. Um, but that's really kind of it, right? I know that you need to have contractors have small parking spaces and everything. But right now you go back there and the entire thing is dedicated to automobiles. And one thing you need to understand about Washington is we have more road space than any other major American city because we have the widest streets. And so this idea that you can't have anything narrow or tight or inconvenient for cars is one that we accept as true, which isn't true. It's not true for any other city in the country. And it's certainly not true for other cities around the world. And so what do we do? Well, what if we just thought about taking some of that public space and uh, giving it life, making it gardens? Um, maybe some of these gardens can be tended by the people that will be in this homeless shelter. What, that might be an act um, of dignity, right? Giving people, uh, uh, you know, something to do or, or something to find pride in or, or find joy in. Um, this is the existing more or less uh, retail. The red in a planning diagram always refers to retail frontage. This is the current retail frontage that's there. But what if we increase that retail frontage back there? What would happen? Might be something like Blagden Alley. Um, and what if you brought all these ideas together? What could you start to have? You could start to have um, like really beautiful, wonderful little urbanism in the middle of this alleyway. It's not, it's not a 
joke. It's not a silly thing like, oh, put trees in the alley and you'll be fine. It's a whole, it's a, it's a whole conception of how you approach design by, by um, having frontages on the backs of these buildings. Maybe there's exits that could be incorporated into these buildings that people from those buildings could have direct access to the alleyway. Maybe there's new retail frontages back there in some of the old garages. Um, maybe we repave it. Um, with cobblestones uh, in part. Um, maybe there's something, some kind of ceiling above you in some of these alley entrances. And maybe some of the alley entrances become entirely pedestrianized and no cars are allowed at all. Maybe we start to think about our city as a place for us, as a place for human beings, rather than a place that's convenient for cars. So I'm gonna show you a few pictures now of places that do this quite well um, in America, primarily just so you don't think this is just some European thing that, well, they can do it in Denmark, but we can't do it here. It's nonsense. Of course we can do it in this country. Uh, this is Boston. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is narrower than any of the alley entrances that we're talking about across the street here from me. Um, this is Charleston, South Carolina, also an alleyway. Um, and you can see the impact of garden walls and, and trees and greenery that, that spill over into that. It gives it a really wonderful, humane um, kind of quality. Um, this is in Philadelphia. This is an alleyway that incorporates um, in a rather assertive way, retail frontage in an alleyway. Um, and it's quite successful. Um, these are both in Seattle. Um, so on the left, you can see um, an entirely pedestrianized alleyway um, in downtown Seattle. And on the right, you see the big sign that there that says clinic on the left, that's a methadone clinic. And then you can see people at a cafe right next to it. And so the idea here is that these two disparate uses, um, you don't have to seal one off and pretend it doesn't exist, right? The homeless live among us. It'd be better if they were treated with the dignity of living in a real place um, than thought of in a fearful way, like, oh man, it's going to be, you know, a pissoir back there. Um, there's ways in which that can be counteracted with design and counteracted with the proper approach to thinking about how we make places. Um, this is in Washington, DC. I understand this is in Georgetown, this is Katie's Alley, but this is a just from a design perspective, what they did here in this alley is really quite clever. The whole thing has been turned into retail frontage is where 20 years ago, it was nothing of the sort. It was the backs of buildings. Um, and maybe you've been to Blagden Alley, um, which is not too far. I don't think it's in Ward 2, but, um, you know, it's not too far. It's near the, it's near the uh, convention center. A lot of restaurants now um, and a lot of public art and a lot of community engagement, which is really the interesting thing about it is all the art that you see in there is all community-based art. Um, and there's a lot of community events back there. It's really quite a lovely experience being back there. Um, and I want to also show this picture. Maybe you've seen this. This is over by me. In Capitol, this isn't in Capitol Hill, but it's near where I live in Capitol Hill. This is called the Mission Muffin Store. And it's a business that is run by the people that live in the shelter that you see right behind the, the little kiosk in this picture. And they make muffins and they sell them to people who work in the area. And it's a successful little business. And there's something about this or the idea of accessing um, green space or being able to garden. Um, to me, it seems uh, like a gesture of dignity and a gesture of respect for the lives of these people who may be mentally ill or certainly whose lives are off track in some way that they don't need to be thought of as a problem or something to be afraid of, um, that they can be included in the community in which they're part of. Now, I understand I'm being very optimistic. I understand. I get it. But we also need to try. Uh, and we also, you know, need to, 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 to make the attempt to incorporate all of us in the, in the city in which we live in. And you have an opportunity to do that back here. Um, this is another, this is another Perkins Eastman project. This is an alleyway at the wharf. Um, and I just have a couple brief suggestions. Uh, the picture here is in San Francisco, um, where they have like uh, Segway rentals in this one alleyway with a bunch of public art. But I think as a culture, we need to question our assumptions about the automobile. Um, for whom are cities? What, what, who gets to determine what a city is designed for? Is it in our lifetimes, it's been for cars, but that is not the way it has been historically, and it's not the way it will be in the future. Um, cities are for people uh, on foot, first and foremost, and we need to approach it that way, especially when we're talking about small spaces like alleyways. Um, I think 
beautiful places, beautiful urbanism, encourage people to treat each other not with fear, but with kindness. Ugliness and harsh architecture and coldness tend to make people at odds with one another. Um, but architecture that engages the public realm as much as possible tend to make places that are beautiful and humane um, and supportive of the, 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 the act of being a human being. And I think it's also important that we never underestimate the power of tiny spaces where we live in a beautiful city with immense public space. But um, if you've ever been to Venice, there's not a single public space outside of the, the main square um, that is bigger than your living room. So um, it's it's something to it's something to keep in mind. So I try to be as brief as I could. I hope I managed to wrap that up rather quickly. Um, but if you have any questions about this or any th thoughts that you would like me to hear, I would be more than happy to answer them or to listen to what you might have to say. Go ahead, Deborah. Hello. Are you calling on me? Yeah. Go ahead. Your hand. Yeah. Thank sure. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I really appreciated what you said, presented very beautifully. I have one question, sure. and I mentioned it here. We have the Mitch Snyder Homeless Center, which is absolutely sad. And I've said myself, there's not a piece of greenery around it. I mean, there used to be, but just what you said, if you make a place beautiful, maybe someone will keep it that way. Maybe someone would tend the gardens there. Yeah. I walk past it quite often, people laying on the street, emergency vehicles that are resuscitating people, people laying there just doing whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, why are they looking at a new place when we have the Mitch Schneider, which could yeah. be rehabbed? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's great that you're doing that. I wouldn't want to live there near it. But I, I, I do think that the Mitch Schneider is a place that's already there. Mm -hmm. It looks it's, it looks bordered up in many places. Uh where I, I just want to be clear about one thing. I'm not. I, I'm not hired at any capacity. I was just asked to to give a talk about ideas, um, um, and I don't have any control over what the city is doing yeah. with that little building. So this, it's not me. Um, I was just. I'm just here to discuss. You're just proposing that it could become a homeless shelter. I, I, I'm, no, I'm no, just no, here no, to, no, 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 no. I'm, I'll explain. Please. Which is great. I mean, that's no, great. No, no. But but the way we the way the city handles other homeless centers. Yeah. They're gonna like that was a wonderful place. I remember when the Mitch Snyder's place opened. They had theater. I know a friend of mine had something called Voices from the Streets there. People were interactive with the community, but now it's pretty sad. So the city just neglects the homeless. I mean, they don't sure. even want to go there. Sure. Okay. Let you, me yeah. give give some background. So thank you, Christian, for, for the presentation. I really learned a lot. And I, I actually, before I give a little more background on the shelter. Christian, you know, I was just looking at the, the map that you showed at the beginning of your presentation, and I know that the alley actually behind Perkins Eastman is quite large mm -hmm. and, ha and has the same kind of potential. And I also yep. know that block from Thomas Circle to, to um, L Street on Vermont, the city is thinking of turning that into a pedestrian plaza. Yeah, and I mean, there's those... alleys by, in my neighborhood in Capitol Hill were crowded with kids. Right, like, and, yeah, and yeah. also- That's where they the... play. One of the buildings along that alley on, it's actually on 15th Street, uh, is going to be converted to housing. So in two years, there, there will be like, you know, 300 more people living right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, like, could we string all of that together? You know, those two big alleys and that pedestrian plaza um, to really bring, bring life to the neighborhood. Yeah. So, so what I wanted to get across was really the idea of occupation and of care. Um, they yeah. weren't specific ideas. I mean, I gave you some some right. kind of specific things, but it's really more the attitude of, of caring for the city and designing it for us as people rather than for our cars um, and for treating one another with as much dignity as we can muster. That's kind of what that was kind of the point, my kind of theory of urbanism. <laughs> yeah, so right. not, not any specific I, design. If you want, I can get into that more in the future, but I, you know, I didn't think that's what you wanted me to talk about today. No, that, I, no uh, this is great. I think it does give a definitely a different perspective on what we can um, think about as we move forward with the development of this area, whatever it becomes. Um, and I, I, I thank you for giving some conceptual view mm -hmm. of some things that I never thought about um, as we considered this, this project. 
uh, that's going to be undertaken at this point. Um, just to let people know that this building was secured uh, by the city um, and was purchased for DHS. Um, they are going to use it for a shelter of some sort, uh, whether that is a, you know, night facility um, or a more of a single occupancy room facility. Uh, the ANC last month did send an email um, and a letter uh, to Deputy Mayor Turnage um, about this project and uh, we were responding based on some information that we had received um, that they were moving forward with a shelter uh, system, um, but they had not determined what type of shelter mm -hmm. yet. So um, I have but, a little bit, bit more information that I've learned since then. So I talked to the owner of Balance Gym because they still run the personal training gym that abuts the alley. And he said a year and a half ago, the city approached him because the city needed an, an emergency hypothermia shelter for the, for the winter a year and a half ago. So they thought it would be immediately used as a probably overnight shelter. That's usually what hypothermia shelters are. Um, and uh, so that was why the city bought that building. And then the owner of Balance Gym was surprised that to this day, a year and a half later, it's still unused and boarded up. Um, so I don't know if the city still intends for it to be a hypothermia shelter or not. But that, that was what place. it was a year and a half ago. I'm sorry. We kind of, I asked about Mitch Schneider's place a long time ago and I will not come to a meeting again because I think I'm asking too many questions, but uh, I mean, everything's rosy and glory. And I really learned a lot and enjoyed the architectural presentation. I have the same Thank feeling you. about that. I have the same feeling about giving people something to be respectful about or, and to respect. But what's going on at the Mitch Schneider's? Now that you say that, it's a total disaster I, there. I, I don't know if that's in our ANC. ANC. No. I don't oh. think it's in our ANC. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Okay, Sorry. then we can share. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. It's a great It's a great comment. Well, um, to yeah, whoever, whoever to does me, care, I think they should draw attention. If you mm -hmm. could tell me who, I would like to contact them and make it some Boy Scouts project or something, because it could be much nicer there. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, we're going to have to move forward. Just, uh, just Nancy, Nancy, Nancy has a question, and then we can move forward. Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, we can talk later in the the in the agenda when uh, we get to the end where the Green Court agenda Again, Nancy. is. But uh, I just wanted to thank uh, our architect friend for these great ideas. I really affirm the ideas. Um, I just want to again say that I would really like to see uh, more of the stakeholders of the immediate neighborhood, including the block, to be involved in these conversations and this vision. Um, for sure, yeah. That's a great a couple, way to make wonderful places. A couple of the places you pluck down trees in your wonderful drawing, uh, I'm pretty sure are on the private property of yeah. my building. Yeah, a lot of them are on private property. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, it would, but uh, people would have to buy into the idea that this is a, that this is a, a, a proposition worth, you know, pursuing. Right, right. Yeah. I'm just saying one of those trees uh, is in the middle of the ac access point to our employee parking garage. Sure. But, and another right. one I mean, is, is where our food trucks uh, need access. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I, I didn't do a detailed survey of it. It was just more of a conceptual <laughs> yeah. idea. Yeah, I, I just I just want to say I love the ideas and thank you for your, for your My work. pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank it's nice so seeing much. you again. Appreciate you very All much. Right. Uh, thank you, Christian. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let me know if you need anything else. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll be in touch. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thank Bye you. now. Um, I would uh, like to move forward. We uh, modified the agenda slightly. And um, is Alex from the downtown DC uh, bed on with us this evening? Sure, man. Alex, hi. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself, Michael? I am very well, thank you. Take it away. Absolutely. So I have my colleague Scott Harris here uh, from Tool Design. 
Uh, he is going to share his screen. Scott, are you on? Oh, there he is. There he is. So um, thank you to ANC2C again for inviting us. Uh, we presented uh, the Downtown Pedestrian Safety and Experience Study uh, on Valentine's Day earlier this year. Uh, so we appreciate you all inviting us back. So uh, the reason that we're here again uh, today uh, is for two reasons. So the first reason, uh, give you all some updates regarding the Downtown uh, Pedestrian Safety and Experience Study, uh, but also one to just get the approval of the community of ANC2C uh, and the commissioners uh, regarding the project and hopefully at the end, you know, getting a letter of support from you all so we can very much move forward with the project. Uh, and with that being said, uh, Scott, could you click on the next slide? Thank you. So uh, quick agenda, uh, some general introductions. Uh, I am Alexander Davis. I am the planning associate at the downtown DC Business Improvement District. Uh, and online with me today that is going to be helping me present uh, is Scott Harris, who is a planner at uh, Tool Design, a national urban design firm. So then we're just going to give you uh, progress on uh, the uh, on the overall project uh, timeline, stakeholder engagement, uh, and next steps. So uh, quickly, for those of you all that don't remember, the overall uh, proposed vision for the uh, downtown DC uh, safety and experience study uh, is to ensure that one, uh, that a public realm is being created that is uh, dynamic, inviting, and comfortable uh, for both residents, visitors, and employees uh, that are working in the downtown DC area. Uh, and in order to accomplish that proposed vision, uh, there's three things that we are looking at, three goals that we are looking to accomplish uh, with the PED study. Uh, and just the first one uh, is making sure that the safety and the experience for the pedestrian in the downtown DC area uh, is improved. Uh, and then second is as we are developing the project, uh, ensuring that we are implementing three quick wins. And as we are making those three quick wins, uh, ultimately those will transform into long-term strategies uh, that will make, uh, that will be much more sustainable uh, and focus on pedestrian comfort and safety. And then third, uh, ensuring that anything that we make uh, within the quick wins or the long-term wins are in alignment with uh, future plans that uh, DC has. Uh, everything from uh, the Gallery Place Corridor study to projects that DDOT is having, uh, we want to make sure that we are properly aligned and we are not cutting across one another. Next slide. So in order to get to where we are today with the PET study, um, we essentially did a um, a combination of both quantitative and qualitative uh, assessments, ensuring that one, we were making sure that uh, we covered the crash histories, the number of uh, collisions that were happening with pedestrians throughout the downtown DC area, examining where are the uh, biggest and highest levels of pedestrian traffic uh, within the downtown DC areas. And as I stated earlier, ensuring that uh, there was alignment and inclusions with other plans, uh, and also ensuring that there was public input, getting that uh, community feel and understanding of if this is something that the community would be in support of, or if this is something that they would rather not have. And so um, putting all those together, we were able to uh, come up with uh, sites that we felt were uh, necessary to examine uh, and continue those three quick wins with. And so when we came to you all in February, uh, we had around six sites that we were looking at. Uh, and as I said earlier, these six sites were determined by um, our both our qualitative and our quantitative assessments, ensuring that one, we were looking at where are the highest volumes of uh, uh, pedestrian uh, and car collisions uh, and then also examining through our public input, where are some of the spaces in which uh, the members of the downtown DC, com DC uh, community are looking for changes? How is their experience as they're walking to and from a grocery store or to a local coffee shop or walking to their office? And how can that be improved? And so uh, just real quickly, uh, those sites that we assessed 
Uh, we gave them a safety score and experience score. If you see at the bottom, there are the scales. The safety scale goes from zero to negative 12. Uh, and the experience scale goes from zero to negative 24. And so with a lot of the sites, um, much of the experience and safety scores uh, were pretty, pretty much teetering towards the uh, bad level. And so the ones that had sort of that negative 18, that negative 12, those are the ones that we were really focusing in on and ensuring that uh, we could create some opportunities in those spaces. So upon further assessment, uh, further public input, uh, and just making sure that we were picking the right place, uh, we were able to finalize two sites ultimately that we want to uh, uh, assess and apply those quick wins. And so for that and explaining those sites, I have Scott, uh, who's going to give us a further breakdown. Yes, great. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. That was an excellent summary. Um, so like Alex said, last time when we spoke to you in February, we presented um, multiple sites and we've uh, currently have two to share with this group. Uh, those are at Chinatown Park and on 7th Street between F and G. So I'll start with Chinatown Park and just uh, let you know how we got here and um, what, our, what our plans are at the moment. So uh, this is a slide we shared with you back in February, so I won't, I won't hang out on it for too long, uh, but just to kind of show you how we got here, we worked uh as we identified these sites we worked on kind of a long-term vision which you can see here in the top right and again this is all just it was very conceptual right just uh imagining what could be um and then knowing that this project uh goal is to do what we call quick wins to, to build something out in a short fashion we started to think about uh short-term solutions and what that might look like uh, so really the key things here that you can take away from the long-term vision is that we've, we've imagined a shared street at some point in the future, expanded park spaces, and really creating some connection uh, to other park spaces that are across Massachusetts Avenue. Um, but bringing it back more towards the present, as we thought about short-term uh, efforts in, on the site, we really narrowed it down to focusing on expanding the park space and activating the park area. Uh, and then also how we might increase pedestrian safety at the intersections. Uh, we also, I think we, we can share this now, we maybe didn't in February. We also took some inspiration from the downtown DC parks master plan, uh, which was recently published and includes this kind of additional vision for the long term of the Chinatown Park area. And you can see this has some similarities to what we've proposed, um, but, but it's uh, nice that this separate effort, you know, they really dovetail together um, and it just really emphasizes that we're not the first folks to, uh, to have an idea like this. So as we started to think about uh, what we could do to activate Chinatown Park and the sort of materials that were at our disposal for uh, short-term efforts, we uh, really kind of created this mood board, for lack of a better term, uh, to, to help display our ideas. So uh, just quickly stepping through these, in the top left, we started thinking about materials that could help soften the street. You know, there's a lot of uh, pavement in the air, a lot of pavement in the street. In Boston, they created these pop-up parks by using um, rollout turf to kind of break up the space and create uh, just a softer environment. Uh, we wanted to create some flexible seating and uh, really a play area that was kind of um, unstructured and not too formal. Uh, so we've taken some inspiration from uh, Madrid in that. And what you see in the middle are just some uh, wooden blocks that can be moved and reconfigured that can be climbed on. Uh, so that that's kind of uh, something we've been thinking about. We also think there's an opportunity here to use extensive branding. This is from um, the financial uh, Flatiron District, excuse me, in New York, um, where they've used extensive branding to really create uh, a signal for people that this is a welcoming space. 
uh, these kind of branded uh, barriers are also a good opportunity to share information. We could share the history of Chinatown, add art to them, uh, really just all kinds of possibilities with those. Uh, a key feature of our design is thinking about asphalt art. Uh, you can see that in the bottom left. This is an example uh, from Baltimore. And this is really an opportunity to use, we think, at both Chinatown and 7th Street, which I'll, I'll get to in just a moment, uh, really an opportunity to create extensive asphalt art to add visual interest to the space and really help define it as a place that people can be. Um, in the middle here, you see a couple of um, a couple of kind of obelisks that were created. This is really just a representation of like we we want to make sure as part of our efforts in this space, we are creating something that can be used to display the history of Chinatown and the surrounding area, um, whether that's photos, uh, maps, uh, writings, uh, just anything that will help honor the area. Um, we envision as, as one piece of this public space. And then lastly, on the bottom right, kind of uh, think things uh, we're all familiar with, tables and chairs. Uh, this is in Golden Triangle. Uh, just some nice tables and chairs and landscaping. Again, creating a place where people can have a coffee or do some work or just, just rest uh, and, and enjoy themselves in the shade. So with those elements in mind, we've kind of developed this concept and I would just, I would emphasize to everyone that this is not, um, the materials you see here are not 100% set in stone. This, those things remain um, in the planning stage. Mm -hmm. uh, the overall layout of the uh, traffic calming and the expanded public space uh, is something we, we uh, have, fairly set at this point and would like to carry forward, although we're always uh, flexible uh, and, and want to be responsive to any concerns. Uh, so this, again, you just see kind of what I've talked about. There are some tables and chairs at either end. We think this creates an opportunity um, with the uh, Chinatown organizations across the street, the synagogue on the southwest corner of this intersection. Uh, there's a La Cologne Coffee on the northwest corner of Sixth and I. Uh, to really create with this these tables and chairs a uh, uh, space for all of those folks to use and activate along with the rest of the public. At the either end, we've proposed a, an additional seating area. And I think we've envisioned that the users of this space may come from the Meridian condos, um, uh, as sort of a, a key stakeholders for those, those tables and chairs. In the middle, this is like you saw on the last slide, an idea for kind of a flexible uh, play area, seating area that we think would be great for kids great for everybody to uh, to use. Uh, along the boundaries, we're showing some steel barricades. Again, this is what we're envisioning as, as a very branded, beautiful, um, nice and welcoming banners on those. And then just a lot of landscaping uh, throughout. Again, just softening the space and really making it inviting. Um, this this is a little more of an engineering drawing, but I wanted to share with you uh, because it it uh, supports the more conceptual drawing on the last slide. This is really a two piece effort. There's there's a signing and mar there's signing and marking, um, which is uh, will be one step, and then installation of some traffic calming, uh, which is really the goal of our public art which should, the plan is, fill in uh, the spaces you see here in blue. Mm -hmm. And so you can see where, where we have um, art basically filling all of these curb extensions at 6th and I, and also at 5th and I. So uh, moving to our second site, this one's a little bit simpler than Chinatown Park. This is 7th and G. Uh, this one, we have a long-term concept and a short-term that are roughly in line with each other. Um, and so as we focus on the short-term concept here, 
This is really about curb extensions, which uh, we'll use to help narrow crossing distances for people on foot, uh, and also to just create some breathing room in front of the arena. We know there's there are issues with pedestrian congestion, um, uh, but really we're focused here on increasing crossing safety. We're also proposing some temporary trees to, to just to add some um, uh, sort of visual heft to, to the corridor. And we will similarly, as I move to the next slide, these areas in blue, uh, the current plan is that these would be art and the would be part of the art and the right of way idea. Um, and specifically around the portrait gallery, we have spoken with the portrait gallery and uh, hope to be working with them on, on designs. So this, this features um, essentially curb extensions that run the east side of 7th Street between um, F and G, and then uh, similarly on the west side. And several of these curb extensions exist today. We're kind of um, enhancing them a bit and just uh, reinforcing them. But this one's really about, uh, it's really um, focused on the pedestrian safety aspect, whereas Chinatown Park, the emphasis a bit more on the public space. And so uh, those are the designs. Alex, did you want to talk through uh, where we go from here, where we've been and where we're headed? Of course. Uh, and so in regards to getting to the design that we're at right now, uh, it's been very much layered in regards to both the community and stakeholder engagement. Um, you all are familiar that we came to you all in February and gave you a uh, good insight into the project. Uh, but previously in starting early, I want to say uh, early winter, uh, we had assembled our advisory committee, uh, which was assembled of uh, DC agencies, property managers, brokers, just to ensure that there are guardrails and insights being provided to us. So we knew that we were headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we essentially opened it up to the public where we had a number of outings at the holiday market. Uh, and we had a survey that uh, we gave to the attendee, attendees of the survey of the holiday market. And then on our landing page on the downtown DC uh, bid website, we had our survey live where we were ensuring that we captured as much response as possible, ensuring that the community's needs were reflected uh, within this project. And that is just in sort of the winter part. So that is like one level of the uh, community and stakeholder involvement. That's one iteration of it. As we move forward and we were basically targeting those sites, we made sure to really talk to the surrounding businesses, residents of that area for Chinatown Park. Uh, we are still speaking to Ted Gong of the 1882 Foundation, uh, and then also speaking to La Colombe, the Six and I uh, Synagogue, uh, the Meridian uh, Condominiums, uh, and then I believe the Chinese Community Church as well. Like I said, making sure that no stone is left unturned. Uh, and that is the same with sort of the 7th uh, G and F area as well, too, making sure that we've spoken to Clyde's, Chick-fil-A. Um, I believe Howard Marks is on this call. We've, sp we've spoken to him and uh, his folks that are at the gallery at uh, the residences at Gallery Place. And we appreciate their contribution and their insights. Uh, and this is not even it. Uh, once we are essentially rolling, continually rolling with the project, uh, we are going to bring in artists that are going to be doing some of the uh, painting within the art of right of way. And so we're going to have charrettes in which we have community members coming out and giving their insights into what they would like to see within those designs. And uh, as I said, we're mm -hmm. ensuring that no stone is left unturned and as much uh, community input is being uh, infused as possible. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So in terms of where we're at right now, uh, the quick wind designs are being finalized. Uh, we are now, uh, essentially we had put out an RFP for local artists that are looking to do artwork within the right of way, those curb extensions. And so we are in the process of reviewing uh, the RFP submissions and seeing which artists uh, best can fulfill our vision. 
Uh, that additional outreach I was just speaking on is going to continually happen, uh, making sure that the community is with us every single step of the way and understands what go what's going on and making sure once we do select that artist that they're involved and hearing exactly uh, what are the designs that they would like to have integrated within those spaces. And what we're hoping for right now is to have the quick win installation completed by August. Uh, so right now we are in the process of ensuring we're working with the different DC agencies with permitting, uh, making sure that everything is in order so we can begin that work as soon as possible. And once uh, we have had that quick installation done in August at those two sites, uh, we're going to have an evaluation and see exactly how the process went, evaluate uh, how that design is going to be impacting those community members, those stakeholders, and then we're going to produce a final report in September. So those are uh, the next steps. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide. And that is our presentation. Any questions, concerns? Yes, Mr. Lee. Hi. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, regarding the Chinatown Park site, uh, was there, um, I know that a lot of parents in the downtown neighborhoods um, don't have a playground. Um, would you consider putting some playground equipment in that park? Because the the next nearest playground is all the way up at 7th and O Street, um, quite a ways away. And having a, a closer playground would be immensely beneficial to parents with young kids. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, in looking at the 7th Street um, sidewalk widening, I believe, um, uh, was there any interest among the, the restaurants that line 7th Street in potentially using some of that sidewalk space for outdoor dining? Um, I'm wondering if that might help with, um, you know, to soften up some of the the the, uh, the issues that, you know, the, that, that we have along 7th Street and might deter people from just kind of loitering when if there are like outdoor diners there in that space. Yeah, I think uh, I'm happy to jump in on the playground question. Okay. Um, I, we, we did not really consider adding any sort of formal playground to the site. I know in the park itself, um, you get into some NPS issues uh, that can slow things down. And I think with this first iteration, the goal is really just to um to get to get a project built um and do what we can to expand pedestrian space and so that's where the kind of um what we're calling like the, the pallet idea in the middle of the newly expanded space sort of serves the function of a playground um recognizing that like actual playground this equipment was just a, a beyond the scope of a quick win but the hope is that um you know, kids love stuff like that, right? So, uh, they love like climbing and messing around with things. So the the hope there is that we're creating something that um, kids will really like. And to just add on really quick to what Scott was saying. So yes, NPS is relatively strict with what goes into their parks. And there are conversations that we're having with them just to see exactly what we can be creative and innovative with. Um, and ultimately, one thing that can happen as of now uh, with this quick win, um, there are various programmatic aspects that can be infused into the park that can have some of those aspects where there are um, sort of outdoor games that can be included. And ultimately, what this can lend itself to as we are making those observations, once we get to that long term run, if we are seeing sort of that continuous like need for it, there could be further exp exploration. Uh, but it, it very much, you know, starts and begins with what NPS says goes. If they are like, that can't happen, it more than likely won't happen. But it's something that we are having continuous conversations with. Uh, and into your second question, um, when speaking to Clyde's and Chick-fil-A, there wasn't an immediate reaction in regards to 
um, the outdoor uh, seating area. It was very much more so focused on ensuring that it would lead to more congestion and it could alleviate some of that pedestrian traffic that they have going through those areas and ensuring that their customers or potential customers are safe as they're going into that space. But I don't think that's a conversation that they would uh, be uh, adverse to, uh, especially DK Kang, uh, Kelvin Nwusu over at Clyde's. Uh, I know they're always looking for opportunities to get more folks into their business. So um, I, I think that's a conversation that uh, while we have not had that yet, that they would be incredibly open to it. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rowe. Yes, just a quick question. Um, once everything is built, who is responsible for the maintenance of things that you put into the park? And that would be the Chinatown Park. <laughs> that would be the SAMs from the downtown DC bid. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, I have some some questions. First of all, thank you very much. I I think that anything that we can do to activate areas in our downtown is is really wonderful. Um, the Chinatown Park has been absent of seating <laughs> for quite some time. And I am really happy to see seating returning to this park. It is beyond me that there are no benches and I understand why benches were removed, and et cetera. But parks are for people to enjoy. Um, and I, I think the seating is gonna be very important. What happens with, um, Alex, you said that this, the SAMs maintain the parks. Um, I know in um, the flagship park, Franklin Park in downtown, I believe the tables are removed in the evenings. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's gonna happen here? We are ensuring that when we get placemaking furnishings, it is stackable and removable. So that is that is something that will be be probably happening, that they will be able to secure it some way that it's not going to disappear and be yes. drug over the neighborhood, et cetera. Yes, sir. That is correct. Got it. Got it. Um, so I think that is great. I do, I, I love the idea of quick wins. What I don't want to happen, and this is, this is unfortunately somewhat, uh, has been somewhat characteristic of downtown DC, is they implement a pilot program that um, has suboptimal material associated mm -hmm. with it or, or movable stanchions, et cetera. And it, it is left um, unaddressed, unregulated. And I use the example of, of the, the pottery or the planters that were placed on 7th Street at the pop-outs that, that were all over downtown and pushed up against the curbs and, and plastic things, et cetera. So I really, want um, to be very kind of conscious that a stanchion with a cover over it is not what I want to see as a commissioner in downtown DC. I want there to be something that creates a wow factor for the people coming to downtown and to using these areas. And I think that you were referring to that, that thing that had like the picture of the bike on it as like a, a, like a branding kind of thing. I don't consider that to be an activation of a space. I hmm. think that is like, woohoo, let's get a quick win and put something up and yay, we're done. And I want to see these things concretize into permanent fixtures. Okay. The, the other item that very much concerns me is along 7th Street. It appears to me that there are flex posts uh, that are going to be put in along 7th Street to allow the sidewalks to be extended. 
I have seen DDOT's implementation of flex posts in the city, and they do a dismal, hmm. dismal job of maintaining these flex posts. Cars hit them, they knock them down, they run over them, they're all askew all over the place. I think flex posts have been a disaster in the city for be for utilization. Um, and just because they're not maintained. Mm -hmm. And a flex post is not going to keep a motor vehicle from running into an area like this. Um, so I just want to put that out there, um, that these are some things that very much concern me. I love, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, I love what you guys are, the concept of what you guys are putting forward. Love it, love it, love it. Um, I'm concerned about making sure that it looks substantial, mm -hmm. that there is a phase two that will be coming down the pike, um, that your pilot will demonstrate um, some very much some achievable goals, um, not, not something that's, that's backed into, but we're going to outline some things up front that we want to measure as part of the evaluation. And I really want the artists who do that work on 7th Street to be DC-based artists. I hear often that we get people from all, you know, all over the place to come into DC to do, to do artwork. And we have fantastic, phenomenal artists here in the city that are not utilized. So I want to just put that out there. We have a world-renowned glass school um, in in DC. You know all these things that artists uh, all all about that I really want them to be utilized um, in this place. And I also encourage you to talk with the residents of the Wallwalk House um, because those residents use that park regularly and have commented to me on numerous occasions about the lack of seating there. So um, those are just some of my initial feedback and my initial thoughts okay. um, on this. And just to respond to the DC-based yeah. artist one, you'll be pleased to hear that all of the artists that have submitted their RP are DC-based. So love it, love it, love it, love it. Thank and you. And then to sort of like the stanchions or those barriers, those bike barriers. Yeah. And I, I can get sort of like the aesthetic behind it. And that's something that we have been cognizant of. And Scott, you can chime in here. One thing that we were thinking about is when we're over near uh, sort of the Chinatown park area, there is sort of like vinyl that you can design and place over those barriers that we were thinking about incorporating. Um, and then also we are moving towards Jersey barriers. Those are things that are still in the process of being considered and possibly infusing some level of artwork with them. Uh, but as we move along and we're getting sort of the permits approved by yeah. uh, DDOT, that's when we'll know and that's when we can get more of the creative juices flowing and be like, okay, well, let's think about it from this uh, point perspective and ensure that we are incorporating some sort of creative, vibrant energy here that it yes. doesn't just end up being a standstill and there's just gray gated gates, uh, yes. gray gates across. That's the, what I the don't board. want. <laughs> we, we're not going for that. We're going okay, very much perfect. engaging. Yes. Perfect. Um, and we'll take one more question. Uh, Howard. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Chairman. Schenkel, uh, Alex and I did go over the plan for 7th Street. And I do have a concern about the extending of the sidewalks, uh, particularly from um, F to uh, H. Uh, this had been a prior proposal, by the way, uh, to extend the sidewalks. And at that point, the building did object on a number of grounds. Uh, two of them, primarily, one is that gives the uh, buskers out there uh, more room for a stage. Mm. So 
Um, although the, the intent here is to provide for more uh, pedestrian, uh, smoother flow of pedestrians, actually, uh, our concern is it'll just uh, give them a wider soundstage for them to uh, harass and uh, to uh, to uh, hector uh, our, our people, 100, 300 people that live in our building who are losing sleep night after night because of these uh, street so-called street musicians. Um, Alex, is is the extension of the sidewalks going from F to H? I thought you said F to G. F to G, yes. F to it, G. Yeah, there are, will be none at H. It's just from F to G. So right to Abpolina uh, Way, I think that's the name of it, or the one that's right next in between um, Clyde's and Smoothie King. That's where the extensions essentially stop. Oh, that's certainly reassuring that it goes up to the G Street Alley and no further north. Yeah. Uh, secondly, in terms of the crosswalk, the east-west crosswalk mm -hmm. between uh, just south of the intersection of 7th and G, okay, right now it's kind of awkward. It, it, it's actually 20 feet south of the actual inter T intersection. T is in Thomas intersection. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I and our dog frequently use that crosswalk. And I think that traffic, northbound traffic, uh, just the other day, maybe even this morning, a uh, uh, metro bus seemed to be confused as to uh, when uh, the driver had to slow down, that the light was changing. And it's sort of an odd location. It's not the usual sort of like a perpendicular crosswalk. It's like 20 feet south of the actual intersection. How that got that way, I don't know. Also, it, it creates a, a, a hazard. When, when cars turn right uh, at that T intersection, that means the traffic that is eastbound on G turns southbound on 7. Uh, that causes an additional pedestrian hazard. Mm -hmm. So please move that crosswalk into a more logical position, perp strictly perpendicular to the intersection. Thank you. And this is um, this is an F. Or is it at G? It's at G Street. So G Street uh, dead ends, so to speak, yes. temporarily dead ends yes. in front of the Capital One Arena. Uh, and uh, it's a T intersection. Might be uh, other people might call it a T intersection. Yeah. The crosswalk at the north side of G. Okay. Okay. Is perfectly logical. I mean, it, it, it's exactly where it should be crossing south. However, the crosswalk on the south side of the intersection, crossing H, is sort of out of place. It's like 20, 25 feet below what it should be. And this causes confusion for motorists, for bus drivers, for truck drivers, for pedestrians. It should be moved northward. By at least twenty feet. Got it. I see. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Good point. And, and Howard, you and I have had uh, previous conversations about that T intersection, uh, specifically some of the signage, which is confusing and sort of leads to more incidents between pedestrians and cars. And I've put a three one one in for that, but. It's something, like I said, once again, that we are continually looking at and having conversations with DDOT about what is feasible uh, for this quick win. So it, it's something that can still be pursued, Howard. So I, I appreciate you uh, keeping us uh, abreast of these issues. Well, just to follow up, the uh, the, the repaving has occurred between uh, 7th and 9th on G. And thank you for doing that, whatever you did to expedite the paving. They've put back, preliminary, put back some of the uh, lane markers. Okay. Uh, but they're the old ones. They're just sort of redoing what was there before. I think as we discussed that we would prefer to have a, a unprotected bike lane. Um, so we have a situation where, gee, 
unprotected bike lanes, sort of hopscotch from 15th to 9th, mm -hmm. 15th to 7th. Some blocks, there is unprotected bike lanes. Other blocks, there is none. So that should be straightened out. I was a cyclist, and I used that, those lanes every day almost to go to 15th and the, the cycle track on 15th to go south towards East Potomac Park. Um, it's very confusing. In one block, they're, they're there. The next block, they disappear. And then the following block, they reappear. It's crazy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Howard. Um, I would like to send a letter of support uh, for the downtown bids plan to implement the quick wins at the Chinatown Park and 7th and G Streets. I second the motion. All those in favor, will you please raise? I don't see Thomas if he's here. Um, three of three commissioners voting in favor of that. Um, and we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, send a letter of support uh, for that. So three commissioners voting in favor. Thank you so much. No, thank you. We appreciate you all so much. Thank we'll get, you. Much. Do we get that to you or do we send it to GDOT or what do you want? Uh, if you could, I, I there is, I think, a TOPS application where you have to yep. send that to. So yep. if you could Got send it. it there, that would be perfect. Got it. Terrific. I will do that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Diane, I believe you're up for DC bike ride 2023. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. This, this is going to be quick. I hope <laughs> there's some issues or something. <laughs> is there, um, real quick. So talking about the DC bike ride happening again this year, date is Saturday, September 9th. This is the event's um, sixth year in Washington. Um, it impacts specifically you guys right at 3rd and Pennsylvania, where the finish line has been for the last several years. Um, the bikers, um, this real quick, this is a 20 mile bike ride, car free. It's not a race, it's a ride, three years old, all the way up to however old you can get. Um, it is a, it's a great event. It supports the mayor's um, Vision Zero program. And it also, um, WAMADA is a, WABA is a, excuse me, Washington Area Bicycle Association is a founding partner of this as well. Um, Care First is a major sponsor as is Events DC and DDOT. Um, again, it starts at West Potomac Park at eight o'clock in the morning and it transverses through the city 20 miles and it finishes up um, along Third Street in front of the US Capitol and the actual finish line is sits at third in Pennsylvania. So it used to be right in front of third street, but I think that now the, the park police have some restrictions on that use of third street. So we can ride through it, but can't stop on it. So that's why it's been shifted up a little bit around the corner. So um, that timeline is again, 8 a.m. start and a 12.30 p.m. finish that last biker is gonna come across. And that cleanup and everything, that area will probably close till about 4.30 or 5, just for the cleanup and the, the breakdown of the structures and everything. So um, the map, I forged you guys a map uh, of the event. Um, again, I don't know if you have any questions. That was real quick, but pretty much the same as it was last year in previous years. Love it. Um, it is, it is, uh... I think it's a terrific uh, ride and opportunity, and it's just a teeny, teeny, teeny little bit <laughs> in our ACANC. So sorry to uh, to uh, keep you on so long, but um, I think it's a great event. Um, commissioners, any questions? Community. Awesome. I'd like to move that we send a letter of support for DC bike ride um, for September 9th, 2023. Is there a second? Do I have a second? I can't hear you. Are you, are you on? <laughs> Yes, it's a second. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting the sign that there is a second. Um, all those in favor, if you could raise your hand. So three of four commissioners voting in favor of that. All right. 
Awesome. And one abstention. Terrific. Awesome. We'll get that off right away for you. Thank you, commissioners and everyone on the call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move to APCA, um, which is our Alcohol Beverage Cannabis Administration. And we have joining us is Jonathan Burns uh, with HQDC House. And Jonathan, I hope I we did not take you away from enjoying Hawaii very long. We're sorry. <laughs> Hi, it's Sarah Shankel. Can everybody hear me okay? We did. And you can see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So I'll give a quick introduction. Chair Shankle, uh, good evening once again, all the commissioners. My name is actually Will DeSantos. So I oh. serve as the, the chief of staff and the head of operations for the Burn, Burns Brothers. Mike Burns and John Burns are not in this meeting, and I'll get to why in a moment. So the Burns Brothers, we are a conglomerate of um, various business lines, and I'll just kind of walk you through left to right. I'll save HQ for last because because that's what we had to talk about. But really, we're a, we're a parent of all these different business lines. So for Koi Collective, what we do is really focus on talent culture programs, and we we try to get people to to think about um, diversity and inclusion in a different way. Uh, with MDO, my diversity officer, what that is 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 um, we leverage artificial intelligence and various avatars to give companies, um, education systems, various stakeholders, micro trainings that they can just take on their own and learn more about um, various diversity initiatives. Blue Cadence is the high performance and wellness arm of our company. And in fact, um, we did some training for, for about 140 employees of DOES last week in DC. So, you know, it's really focused on, on, on how people can, can perform better. Uh, Manchester Park, uh, cultural marketing and communications arm. It's it's really just what what that states. It's a it's a Marcom's piece of our agency. Icon Talks is a celebrity speaker series. Um, the most recent thing we did with that was honor Roy Wood Jr., who also spoke at the White House Correspondents Association dinner uh, last month. So you may be familiar with him. Um, very funny guy. Okay, and the final piece is the HQ, which I'll dive down to um, here in a bit. Okay, so Mike and John Burns, that's them right there. Um, uh, they are, I, I wanna apologize on behalf of them. So they're currently sitting on the White House South Lawn, um, putting on the first ever production of a Juneteenth celebration um, on the South Lawn. So the president's there, Dr. Biden, the vice president, <laughs> the second gentleman, and there's about a thousand people on the South Lawn. I'm getting live pictures and videos as we're going through this presentation and uh, it looks like they're all having fun out there. So, you know, they created the Burns Brothers as a result of the unrest a couple of years ago um, associated to the George Floyd incident. And so we've really kind of taken that and, 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 and built a, an agency, a company, um, various business lines that all kind of tie in culture um, and making the, the, the world a better place essentially. Okay, real quick, that's our team. What we will leave, I'll just talk about the values that, that kind of thread all the way through the various business lines. So you can read them there. But but the, the key is, is that we truly believe that, that in everything we do and every client that we take on various business lines, we want them to share these values. And we want to ensure that, that um, we're empowering everything through community. Okay, who we work with. So this is just a, a quick list of uh, various clients that, that we've touched over the past couple of years um, to include Amazon. We uh, we work with them in, in lots of different capacities across business lines. Um, we do diversity training work with City, BlackRock, BNY Mellon. And you can see down there in the uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we threw a plug in there for the, for the White House because we are indeed doing that event uh, today as part of our, our uh, events and activations on. And I'll go back real quick. The, the event that I'll, I'll just hone you in on the picture in the middle, um, Zondo, Zondo Mandela, he's uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson. We hosted him about a year ago to have a discussion about how we do, um, or how we improve or unemployment situations in South Africa. And so we had a lot of BC stakeholders in the room 
who may own companies, they may be, you know, fairly well off. And how do you marry kids who are coming out of college in South Africa with very little um, employment opportunities? How do you marry that to, to various D, uh, stakeholders in DC who may have opportunities for them? So just want to highlight that as a pretty cool thing. Okay, so we're here to talk about HQ DC House. So this is the location where kind of all the business lines marry up and come to. And so what we like to refer ourselves to as is, is the house of affirmation, where people come, they can unwind, they can be themselves. It can be, be anybody from, we've hosted congresswomen, congressmen, various celebrities, you know, you might be a lawyer, you might be, you know, a fast food worker. You know, it's just really a, 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 a marrying of all these different types of people, innovators, thought leaders, creators who, you know, all welcome to, to join the club. This is what it looks like inside. So we're at the corner of 6th and F, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit real quick. So we took over a lease on the second floor um, in July of 2021. About six to eight months ago, we expanded out to the fourth and fifth floors. And so right now in the building, it's a five-story building, we have the second, fourth, and the fifth floors, just to kind of orient you in. Mm -hmm. So in the, on the left, you can see one of the buildings that was spoken about earlier with Metro on the ground floor. And I forget the lawyer's law firm that was spoken about this, that's supposed to take out the rest of the space. So that's orienting you that way. And we're right across the street from the Capital One. Okay, so this is why people come to HQ. Again, we see ourselves as a, as a place of affirmation. We do various events um, with various clients. So as an example, tomorrow, uh, we have a client that's called the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Mm -hmm. And so really what they do is fight big tobacco. And so we, we bring various stakeholders into the room and have panel conversations about how, how we combat that. And so that's an example of what we do um, in the space. Okay, in the community, a couple more examples of what we do in the space. I'll, I'll highlight you to the middle bottom picture. We did an event last year in conjunction with Nike, radio, and Howard University to have students come into the space and design sneakers. So it was a pretty cool uh, competition where we got to touch the, the, the community as well, <laughs> excuse me, in the, edu in the educational space. And, and really, you know, just a, a gathering of minds and a, a, a positive event that, that, that ended up being great for all. Finally, this is another look <laughs> at the fifth floor. You're looking over there at the, at the gallery, again, the, the Metro place across the, across the way. This is on the fifth floor conference room. And I just want to highlight some of the things that, that we've been featured in over the past um, three to four months. So, so again, really a place of, of community. Um, we, we've been on the block for about two years now, still expanding within the space. And, and as I go through and I listen to a lot of these presentations, I think we bring a lot of value to the area. Um, we have a lot of clients who come in who now frequent the Chinatown area, the Pankwater area, because we exist there. And so we, we think we bring a lot of um, value to the community and, you know, appreciate your support. Awesome. This is really great. So this is a, it's a private club. And is it, is it open seven days a week? Or is it just when events happen? Or tell me how that works. Yeah, so we're, it's, and, and we shudder about the word club, because it's not, you know, the context of club is right. people lined up to pay entrance and we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So so we're open Monday to, to Friday and, and people, it's a paid membership club. So if you want to come in, flop down your laptop, get on a Zoom call, there are several um, members who do that every day of the week. And so, you know, you can see it as kind of like a, a WeWork concept, but it's not really that. You know, we provide food, we provide drinks, you know, just a place to come sit and relax, do some work. So Monday to Friday and, and Saturday and Sunday are kind of 
uh, event based. So if there is something going on, we will open on those days. Like a couple Saturday Saturdays ago, we opened for um, a boxing session. So members could sign up to, to kind of come get training on some boxing tied to the wellness portions of what we do. You know, we've hosted yoga sessions, those type of th types of things on Saturdays. So not not um, continually, but when there are events tied to it. Got it. Got it. So, um, so what, um, so I'm just going to share my screen here just one second. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Um, so what you are asking from us tonight is to um, provide support for the retailers class CX private club license from APCA. And yes. um, this would be um, an endorsement of a members only establishment with live performances, panel discussion, private events um, and rentals, as you said, seating capacity of 100, a total load of 150. Uh, the hours of operation there are kind of really standard uh, 12 to 11, 8 to 11. Uh, Thursday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 12, Saturday, 10 to 12. Um, alcohol typically stops a half hour before um, and live music and live live kind of activities, performances would stop like a half hour before, before that. Um, I think this, uh, it, do commissioners have any questions of Will? Or of the club or any community members? Other than if you're in Hawaii, is it not almost three o'clock in the morning, sir? In Hawaii? Uh, it's it's uh, almost <laughs> three in the afternoon. So oh, I'm six okay. I've got, yeah, that's right. Six hours behind, not six hours ahead. Okay. Yeah, Still behind. a good level of commitment, but we're no need to rush you. Oh, you know, happy to happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to move that we send a letter of support for the HQDC house. Seconded. Um, and all those in favor? Sorry. So uh, three of two commissioners, uh, three, I'm sorry, three of four <laughs> commissioners, I'll get this right, uh, voting in favor of that. Um, Will, do you need a stipulated license? A stipulated license would, um, if approved by ABRA, would allow you to start operating um, immediately. I, I you know, I, I'm not sure about the ins and outs, Chair. You know, based on how you described it, I think the answer is yes. Okay. I'm just not quite sure how that process works. Yes. Um, so it, it would allow, it would basically allow you to operate. Um, your roll call hearing is um, July 31st. So if there were no, uh, Organizations can protest your license up until July 10th, um, and then there will be a hearing um, afterwards, July 10th, that would give, you know, that um, if there was a protest, they would hear the protest at that time, or ABRA would rule to give you uh, the license. Um, so I, I would kind of recommend, it sounds like you're, you're established in that location, you're looking to move forward, that I think you probably would want a stipulated license. Yes. Um, so I would like to move that we also send a letter of support for a stipulated license for HQDC House. Seconded. Uh, seconded, <laughs> and all those in favor? So three of four commissioners voting in favor of that. So we'll get that off as well. So you'll continue through the, the APCA process, but this will give you if you if if you're the group decides that they want it, they can use this letter as an opportunity to get uh, a stipulated license to start operating immediately. Great, thank you. That sounds great. Awesome, sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. We appreciate you and welcome to the neighborhood. Well, not welcome. We look forward <laughs> to to expanding in the neighborhood. Yes, so absolutely. So thank fantastic. You, yeah. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, everybody. Um, next up, we have. Ashley Tu from City Center um, and 
Ashley is going to talk with us about the placement of some benches. Thank you for hanging in there, Ashley. Very exciting here. <laughs> um, so yes, so if you don't mind, I'll share my sure. screen so I can just kind of show you guys the uh, proposal. So yes, we are looking um, to add four, I, I would call them more seats, but they're, they're you know, be benches adjacent. Um, so they are, we're looking to propose uh, to install four of them. They are on the north and south side of I Street. Uh, so this is a photo of what we are proposing. Uh, we have similar stone, um, this exact stone actually throughout the entire project. Um, and so these are, would only be roughly like 600 pounds, I believe 620 each. Uh, we are, not only are we looking to just add additional seating, but we're looking to create a safer environment for pedestrians. We have had uh, numerous occasions where vehicles have gone um, both into the plaza area and up into this area. As you can see, this dips down um, for the pedestrian walkway. So um, with it being right next to valet, sometimes people just mistakenly think it's a street. So this will also um, assist in preventing vehicles from going up onto those pedestrian areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you wanted to get a, this is just an overall view of this, the project. So they would be um, right here yeah. in these two areas. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that's well, this all. seems very straightforward to me. It seems very logical. We don't <laughs> want cars running in walkways. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> I move that we send a letter of support for the placement of these benches, QB things, <laughs> marble, marble, 600 pound marble seats. Um, Thank you. Awesome. I'll be happy to second that. Okay. Thank and you. all those in favor. So three of four commissioners voting in favor of that. Um, is, did you, have you submitted this to? Um, yes. We've submitted for permit um, and we should hear hopefully before the end of the month here. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I haven't seen it uh, appear in my feed yet. So um, it must be working its way through the process. Mm -hmm. So this is great. We'll get a letter of support off for you. I think it's awesome that that is moving forward. Um, does, does Heinz still own the, uh, the parking lot adjacent to this that's, that's empty? No, that's actually, so that's actually the one piece of city center we don't own. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. that's uh, owned by the, the Gould family. The Gould family, okay, got it, got it, terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, being here and thank you for sharing. Yep, thank you so much. Awesome. Um, next up, we have um, for planning, zoning, environment, and historic presentation, 1717 K Street Northwest, um, AKA 1000 Connecticut Avenue Northwest, um, an application for minor modification to PUD um, 0613. And we have uh, Mary with us. <laughs> awesome. awesome, hi Mary. Hi, how are you? Good evening. Very well, also thank known you. as uh, Carolyn Brown from the Brown. Oh, Long Carolyn Park. Brown. Okay. okay. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's my alias. Yes. Um, uh, thanks so much for um, having me here this evening. Uh, I'm going to share my screen briefly. Um, and let me know when it comes up. If oh, there it goes. I got to do this. Hopefully, you can see that now. Um, it is coming up. Yes. So there we go. Perfect. Um, as you mentioned, this is to add habitable penthouse space of the building at the northwest corner of Connecticut and K. Uh, it's located here near adjacent to Farragut Square. Mm -hmm. um, here is a configuration of the existing penthouse, and you'll see that there's an area sort of outlined in uh, the pink that shows the setback area to meet the requirements of the zoning regulations. And it's to the right of the screen that you'll see the change um, to 
include now a conference room, a multi-purpose room, and on the front of the building, a gallery. Uh, this is the view, aerial view of what the expansion will look like. It meets all the zoning requirements for setbacks and uh, we would seek your approval of the project. Uh, for just for your information, the, the habitable penthouse space will require a contribution to the affordable housing trust fund. The estimate uh, based on the additional square footage and the um, assessed value of the land is the total contribution will be in the neighborhood of $800,000. Uh, half due at the time the permit building permit is issued and the remainder due at time of certificate of occupancy. Uh, so we would, uh, again, ask the ANC for its support in a letter to the Zoning Commission. Got it. And the the modification is to add this space to the, the roof, right? Correct. Just and what you see in this just, diagram here. And is this a... Um, um, uh, uh, an uh, apartment condo building? No, it, it is an, an office building that was uh, constructed in roughly 2008. It was completed roughly in 2008. It was a planned unit development. Um, mm. And um, when they had the new penthouse regulations changed, uh, I think it was 2014, Yeah, if I got that right. Um, most buildings could add the penthouse habitable space as a matter of right, but if it's a planned unit development, it requires a minor modification to the planned unit development before the zoning commission. So that's, yeah, they did, and they did the exact same thing. The same ownership group roughly has the building to the south and they got that approved. Okay. Yes. And this was obviously an ANC 2B last time around. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, terrific. Right. Um, any questions, commissioners? I'm all in favor of public space on roofs and outdoor space. So I am thrilled about that. Um, um, I'll make a motion to write a letter of support to the zoning board uh, supporting this project. I'll second okay. that. Awesome. So um, Sorry, well motion and a second, all those in favor, please raise your hand. So four of four commissioners voting in favor of that. Uh, when it, when do you have your hearing? Uh, it will be uh, scheduled for the July 13th, I believe it is, Zoning Commission meeting. Got it. We will get a letter of support out for you for that. Thank you very Wonderful. much for coming to us and, Thank and you so uh, presenting much. this. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Um, next on our docket is 509-517 H Street Northwest Residential Project. Uh, Stefan. Rod Roger? Rodiger. Rodiger. Oh, I always mess it up. Rodiger. Close. Close. Um, you got my managing first name. partner of Rift Valley Partners. Um, right. Stefan came before us before um, about this project, and there's been some updates um, that he would like to uh, present this evening. That's right. Yeah, it's it's been about five months since uh, I came before you in January of 23. So, um, uh, thank you for having me again, Stefan Rodiger from Rift Valley Partners, uh, Ward 2 business and uh, Ward 2 resident. Um, I live here too. Awesome. So uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, share the screen and kind of get the show on the road and just kind of revisit what you've seen before. Some of it might be repetitive for folks, but um you know, I just wanted to talk about the project that I first presented five months ago, 509-517-H Street, which is uh, outlined here in, um, in red. It's a, you can call it a longer term lodging use of 47 residential units, full, basically full apartments that will be longer term stay. Um, as people are most, you know, familiar with uh, this block, um, uh, it's uh, 1880s Queen Anne, uh, beautiful buildings. Uh, originally, this was all residential. And through time, through the years, hundreds of years, um, hundred over 100 years, it's gone through some use changes, including putting retail on the where you see the golden nails and the full key 
um, some of this uh, below grade uh, retail use was once residential. So that's kind of the uh, existing conditions uh, today. Um, and we, uh, what I wanted to do since January, we I came in front of you to just um, present the project before we went in front of uh, Historic Preservation Board. And we, we went in front of uh, the board in February. They really liked the project, but they wanted to see the project more context. So we, we went back to the drawing board um, and put uh, the building, placed the building, the proposed building within um, a couple different views. And at the same time, uh, the um, the board wanted us also to just provide the support letters uh, from the community. And we went through um, this entire block, including Chinatown Market, uh, 519 uh, H Street right here, the property owner, all about burger on this corner, which now has some signage, um, as well as uh, 507 and 505 H. So we, we did a reach out throughout this block and then around, you know, around the corner and have support support letters from Way Luck from um, from uh, a couple of churches now. Uh, so we we really tried to expand the footprint of community outreach and support, and that's that's really what we were doing in February, March, and then April twenty seventh, uh, over about six months, uh, six weeks ago. A historic preservation approved. Uh, and why I'm in front of you today is that we're going to submit uh, a board of zoning adjustment uh, application for three areas of relief that I wanted to uh, just go through with you on the rationale for why we're asking this type of relief on this project. So I just, um, as you know, it's between 5th and 6th Street. It's mid-block. Um, this is uh, um, basically the latest drawing from uh, from Friday for what we're going to submit uh, as supporting documentation. So I think everyone's familiar with the site. Uh, it's five properties, and this is just a refresher for anyone, the commissioners or people um, here, just to, to get a sense of the different views, context of the neighborhood. Because uh, the previous presenter, I like the idea of embracing place uh, and people and buildings, historic places. So this is this falls right in that category. Um, and what the commission also, uh, it, historic preservation also asked for is they really wanted to understand the the back alley condition and just um, what it looked like and what was happening back there, and what we were going to do to hopefully improve the the um, not only the front but the the back alley, ten foot alley. So this is the current condition, and I'm just showing you the uh, the five the five basically the four lots um, with the full key and five eleven actually being one lot. So that's the existing conditions with a H Street ninety foot uh, H Street width ten foot alley, and then there's an alley running north south here. And then you, of course you have Sixth Street and Fifth Street, and this is uh, just a plot showing. Um, the alley condition, and you know, uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more of what we, um, what historic pres preservation um, uh, approved, and uh, what we're trying to do with the zoning relief. So, um, if you can, if you look at this a little bit closer, the red dash line is the is the property line. Um, you can see there's existing stairs, stoops, historic sta stairs. Um, that project into uh, public space, and we're going to preserve all those, restore those. Um, and then we're proposing the only property at grade, at grade is 509 H Street, which we're proposing as the building entrance and lobby. Um, and then uh, what, uh, what you're seeing here is in the back is we're proposing a rear setback of 13 uh, feet seven inches, which uh, the requirement above 25 feet in this zone is a uh, 20 foot setback. So we're we're asking for about seven feet uh, of relief on the rear setback requirement. So I'm just going to continue to go through these drawings. So this we're, this is basically something I think you you did see, but it, we were trying to show 
uh, context within um, you know uh, the different buildings on the block uh, with Way uh, uh, Wayluck and um, you know a couple other buildings uh, on the super block. So this is this is what historic preservation actually uh, approved on our project, which is which I'll go into. Um, uh, it's a you know a nine story building um, set back from the, the the historic buildings having green roofs both on the above the historic structures and at the rooftop, and then the addition goes behind. And what we are trying to do negotiate with. Uh, HPRB is to try to pull the building as close as we could to H Street. And you can see this cantilever um, that uh, doesn't land, doesn't sit on the historic buildings, but is over the historic buildings by five feet. And this was a way that we were able to uh, get more manageable, workable floor plans on a double loaded corridor in the, um, in the back addition. So with the three uh, areas of relief we're asking for, this is a good exhibit just to, um, to start with. Uh, we're asking for the requirement in this zone is a, uh, the first one is a loading berth um, within the building. And what we, uh, what we decided to do is pull back. We didn't have to, uh, but we pulled back as I discussed the, um, the building almost nine feet from the 10 foot alley. So we can incorporate um, some requirements for the building, uh, which there's a, a loading zone for, um, uh, for waste management, uh, recycling, as well as the initial FF&E uh, uh, installation. And then the, um, um, the two two times a week, um, basically servicing of the building with linens. So as with a longer term stay lodging use, um, they're full, the apartments are fully furnished. Uh, they don't get turns every day. They get turns only when when the uh, the occupant, um, the resident, longer term uh, resident, uh, 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 vacates the unit. Or if they ask, so it's typically a typical stay is three to six days. So uh, you know, on on average, you're going to just have one one turn for the unit, um, unless they ask and they want to get the apartment cleaned. Uh, so there's going to be de minimis. You know, it's not going to be like a hotel use where you have linen service every day. This is going to be probably twice twice a week. And then um, second, we're you know we're looking at um, you know, making sure that there's full access to the back alley, the 10 foot alley by using this loading unloading zone entirely on our property. And we have the, um, the, uh, the, the trucks that can fit here and are able to, um, basically service the, the trash and recycling where we have compactors in the trash room. We have a roll up door where they just roll it out when they when they come uh, and wait for the uh, the trash service, which will be two to three times a week. Uh, and then they can leave the alley. So they they either come in on Fifth Street or on Sixth Street and there's no turning. Since this is a very tight alley, mm -hmm. we actually had a hard time, you know, doing a three point turn of a of a um, garbage truck into the building. So I think we we try to come up with the most practical approach, and we're using Grove Slade um, as our transportation traffic consultant uh, and working on a management plan, which will be required when we're looking at this relief, which we're asking for the um, the loading berth basically to uh, occur outside of the building. So that was that was the first um, area of relief we asked for. The second is that we're proposing uh, that the building is entirely uh, residential lodging use. Um, so the subterranean, uh, you know, they're about four to five feet uh, below grade. Those um, those units, uh, those spaces that are currently retail but were originally residential, we're proposing that they become units that um, can be accessible 
from the street, you can go down and go into a unit and you can go up into a unit on the first floor. And we're proposing this because we've engaged a couple of retail brokers uh, as well as spoken to the downtown bid. And at this location with um, a very narrow street um, sidewalk because of the projecting uh, stoops and sub uh, subterranean uh, not at grade uh, um, uh, spaces that are currently retail, as well as it's it's eight feet or less for the um, the ceiling heights, which is not not optimal for retail. And then it's broken. HPRB wants us to maintain these demising walls, so we can't open this up for kind of a larger retail space. So all those factors have contributed to a um, to our determination that the best use for this these spaces is actually a lodging use um, where we we fully activate it, light it. We want to light it up. We want to use um, you know Chinese design elements on the signage uh, and really and restore the entire facades here so it looks beautiful and it's safe and secure. So that's that's our proposal and we're submitting supporting documentation with the application for our retail analysis and the retail study that we did. So can that's, I, yeah, sure. I ask you a question. So the relief here is that, that these are going to not be, um, retail units is that right but lodging. that's right yeah it's so we're gonna it's not going to be ground floor retail we're going to ask for ground floor residential use and the one commercial uh historic building that's basically accurate the full key that's the only um location where we can provide an accurate ADA accessible um, building entrance. Right. So yes, and in, in this case, it doesn't come free either, is that we're gonna have to go and buy credits um, to compensate because it's in a mixed use, uh, it requires ground floor retail. And since we're proposing not to do retail, we're gonna have to buy credits and most likely we're gonna buy them. We've been speaking with uh, DC OTR about buying those credits. So hopefully, hopefully we can we can reach an agreement. They haven't really sold. DC hasn't just for your information, they haven't really transacted and um, and not many developers have bought credits recently. So it's it's hard to determine what the market is. Um, but that's just a sidebar. But we're, you know, we, we think this is the highest and best use and 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 appropriate for this block, mid block. Um, where we can actually do a better job of activating the entire block by creating these uh, lodging uses. Um, Steve, Stephen, do you know the abbreviation for OTR? What is that? Office of? Tax and Revenue. Oh, Tax and Revenue. Oh, oh okay, got it. Yeah, sorry, I use, no. I use acronyms. Yeah, Tax and Revenues. Um, so what were the, the other... The other things that you, that you're asking for approval, so it's the the change in use, it's the being change. close to the alley, and then and then the uh, loading, the loading, loading. requirement. Yep, those three. So I might be a little bit long winded, but um, those are the three areas of relief. And I was going to send a follow up, you know, kind of summary letter uh, of you know uh, explaining these in a one page document so you, so you have it for your record and hopefully a letter of support. I just have a quick question on the loading issue. Sure. Uh, I think when you presented to us in January, you talked about potentially this also being condos. I think that the, the final use was maybe not yet um, determined. So my question is with, with all this lodging, if you end up wanting to turn it into permanent lodging, you're now lacking a, a loading dock area for people to move in and out. When you say permanent, uh, I think I, you know, in in um, January we we weren't sure if it was a apartments, just you know, conventional longer term uh, apartments, or you know, just short, basically short term uh, lodging use. So it's it's a uh, it's a short term lodging use that we're proposing um, with uh, you know basically um, you know. 
the move in move outs will be through the front door of um you know of people with suitcases um and you know there's every probably five to seven years there is kind of a refresh of the ff and e mm -hmm. um so um but everything and we we had meetings with office of planning as well as uh d dot with with our transportation consultant and um and you know they they said you need a loading plan you need to come up with a loading plan and analysis mm -hmm. of of how you're going to service this building um and i went through kind of the general dynamics of how we serve a uh, a lodging use a short-term rental lodging use uh and they were they were actually comfortable with with our proposal and we're just now you know going through the analysis and the documentation of the narrative to submit okay thank you yeah no sure when you walk in through the um the lobby and you get to the back there, do, do you have to go downstairs to get to a corridor to access the apartment from the back? Can you access, I guess, from the street and the back? Yes, yeah, good question. Be, um, because this really should be two, two plans because they're at different elevations. Um, it. it was something we were supposed to do, but yes, you go down and you can access just like you can today. You go down uh, the stairs, and you know, there's an alcove yeah. go through the door, and and here's your unit. At the same time, you can you can come off. You have to go down the stairs because uh, this is a basement condition, five feet down, kind of somewhat an English basement. And you can right. go through. You can enter any of these units, and then this is all at the same grade. Gotcha. So yeah. Okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the key is office of planning was, you know, they wanted to make sure that uh, you can access and you're going to activate and you're going to kind of celebrate Chinatown with um, with these residential uses. So, and, you know, we agreed and we we've, we've engaged Chris Shaheen at office of planning, who's going to mm -hmm. convene the Chinatown steering committee. And yep. we're just waiting uh, from Linda. We're waiting to hear from Linda Wang about about that. So you guys are welcome to participate. Yes. Um, I think this, I think that what you have done for this space had, is, is really um, great. You've done a lot to take into account the recommendations of community. Um, so I do appreciate that, especially the setback in the alleyway, which is you know, that small space residents were concerned about um, the the closeness of the buildings, getting vehicles back there for unloading. I, I think it's a, a great use. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so I can I can go, I can just quickly go. I know it's getting late. Um, <laughs> but I can uh, I can answer any questions and and continue to go through the plans. I, I probably have five more minutes to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, so this is the first floor, and again, um, you can, you know, these are all fully accessible um, uh, uh, doors that you go up the stoop, uh, or you go you go down the stoop into the unit, and you can, of course, ADA compliant. You can uh, you can access your unit from the corridor. So in the uh, the building doesn't have many. It has two amenities. We we figured out how to squeeze in a fitness uh, room. And we're doing a common um, a common terrace. Uh, so those are the it's 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 uh, we think the neighborhood's the amenity, uh, and we're going to do a lot of you know outreach with businesses, which we've already done. So people don't stay don't stay in the building per se, like with all the amenities of a typical hotel, but they actually go out into the neighborhood, which we think is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is just showing, uh, basically this red dash line is what we're preserving. This is the historic and then, um, uh, shaded in gray and the white is the new addition in the back. And so this is the third floor and then, uh, the fourth floor. And this is where, um, you know, the green roof over, the historic buildings, which is will be required uh, with uh, DCDOEE, which I've reviewed the plans as well as 
the GAR uh, uh, requirements. And then what um, what we're going to mm -hmm. have uh, with the rear yard setback, where we're basically we're we're showing 13.7, and it's what's required is 2010, uh, 20 almost 21 feet in setback. It starts, as you can see, in the third and fourth floor, because on the first, second floor, the first 25 feet, not required to set back the building, but we thought that was important to do for the program and for the adjacent um, mm -hmm. buildings. So what we're trying to do is just show, um, you know, at a basic level that we, we really need that additional setback to create livable apartments with a, uh, a fairly efficient uh, double loaded building. Um, and it really didn't work without having this rear setback because you couldn't get a double loaded corridor, you couldn't get the efficiencies of a building to make it work. So that's what we're trying to convey and demonstrate um, in this, in this uh, diagram. And this is for the third and fourth floor. So the hatched area shows if, if we actually, as you can see here, um, this is what um, we'd be left with if you took out this hatched uh, red area, mm -hmm. uh, which wouldn't really be workable. It would be more like a typical hotel room, a very you know shallow, a small, very small kind of micro hotel room, which we didn't. We actually we didn't think that was a good business plan. We thought it was better to do full fully furnished apartments. Mm -hmm. so is, is that an overhang? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, and this uh, yeah, so it's a cantilever. Um, okay. Yeah, and and this was again trying to just capture every foot matters in these you know these uh, kind of urban infill historic. Uh, historic districts where you really you really can't you can't build on top of uh, and sometimes we we're working with uh, Steve Kalka and HPRB about you know to cantilever and get an additional five feet to make these these units work from a floor plan and um, from a mm -hmm. floor plan perspective and you know we were working on the outside with historic preservation and then we were talking about functional floor plans that we think would be that would work that would be marketable and attractive for people visiting DC and staying here mm -hmm. you know, longer term. Stephen, uh, getting getting to that green roof for a second, that's people won't be able to use it, right? It's just correct for okay. Would DC allow you to put turf there? I mean it'll serve the purpose of you know being absorbent. It serves the purpose of, of a green roof, but at the same time, people can still sit on it or walk over it. I mean, I think that'd be something that might be interesting that you know, if they allow you to do that, that, you should pursue. Yeah, that would be, I mean, it would be to our advantage to have activated mm -hmm. outdoor space for, right. you know, for some of these, for the fifth floor, at least, that were... Um, right, exactly. Um, you know, it's usually, you know, plant... Um, sustainable native plant plantings that we'll use, but yeah, we we you, to, we really this is conceptual. So we're you know we're going to get into more detail as right. we move to schematic and um, get past uh, zoning. Yeah. So that's yeah. Okay. yeah that's, we did think about that, and and then this is uh, a step back on the ninth floor, which we were able, mm -hmm. um, this is the top floor and mm -hmm. there's a terrace that we think will be private terraces, but we don't, they could be public. We just, we just haven't done enough market research to determine what we're going to do, but there's some outdoor space on top that will be very nice and have some, some good views and be attractive. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. This is this is great, and um, I I think it is an awesome design and concept. And uh, I would like to move that we send a letter of support uh, for the three areas of relief: the uh, relief of the setback from the property line, um, mm -hmm. the relief from the loading berth, um, um, and uh, the relief. Uh, from the uh, ground floor retail. Mm -hmm. 
Oof. Um, it, it, Michael, quick question about the ground floor retail, uh, meaning this is like the step down area, right? Yes, it would be. It would be. It would not be retail. It would be lodging only. Right. I mean, I, I'm wondering how attractive you know those 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 below grade units would be for lodging. Just knowing how close you are to the sidewalk and you know, how little privacy you'll have um, with that window. Um, uh, is it because of ADA requirements and 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 lack of commercial um, prospects that we think that, you know, that we think that retail just won't work in, in, in those areas? Yeah, and, and at least in, in these these four commercial properties, you know, we went through um, just starting from the outside, the challenges, the critical challenges are that you can see these, these are really, they're pinched um, areas, um, which kind of breaks up the retail flow here. They're mm -hmm. all, the retail is below grade. It's they're English basements. Um, so they're not good for elderly or families, you know, pushing strollers. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not, none of them are ADA compliant. Mm -hmm. um, the ceiling heights, if you are welcome to come, um, you know, they're eight feet and, and, and under, uh, mm -hmm. we can't change the elevations. So they're, you know, for retail, they like to see, you know, nine, 10 feet and open yeah. spaces. And all these yeah. are actually, they're demised. There's demising walls that we have to keep that break up these spaces. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, they're very small. These are, you know, 500 square mm -hmm. foot, um, mm -hmm. kind of units spaces. So it, it's, um, it, it, it's challenging and then light and just light and air um mm -hmm. it's good yeah. you know, for retail so the, the better you, this will kind of be our kind of it'll probably be our, our most affordable unit but we mm -hmm. think it's a better it's a better use um as lodging as longer term rental mm -hmm. than it is mm -hmm. retail okay yeah, I mean, I guess if that's what you got to do, yeah, that's what you have to do. Um, one thing that uh, just bear in mind is, you know, just safety, um, uh, safety issues with uh, with uh, with that with those areas. Uh, I know that people like to hang out down underneath those stoops right now, right? And so that's something that you'll have to factor in when you're considering how are you going to incorporate residential usage or lodging issues in the, in that space at the same time, you know making it safe right. for your, your, your clients to use. Right. right. And the operators we've spoken to have some good ideas um, where there is this condition with, you know, lighting, um, security cameras, um, and other security measures um, with just staff walking, we'll need security here. So we, we kind of have a layered approach to, to making these as attractive as possible. So there is a motion on the floor to um, send a letter of support for the PUD. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, a second from Commissioner uh, Strauss. Um, all those in favor? So four of four commissioners voting in favor mm -hmm. of that. So um, Stephanie, if you could get um, the, uh, if you want to send over your letter, that would be awesome. Okay, I'll do that um, by tomorrow. You got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank for your you time. so much. We appreciate you. Yep. Seeing the neighborhood. Awesome. Definitely. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye. Um, and our final item is to continue the discussion of 1339 Green Court Northwest and uh, an update on that, uh, what we know to this point. I'm not sure there's that much. Um to talk about right now. I, I told you guys that actually the city bought it very quickly because they thought it, they needed an emergency shelter. And the question is then why did they just leave it abandoned for a year and a half, which also isn't great. But um, yeah, I, I, I wonder I wonder why city officials didn't tell us that also when they came to talk to us, because that's what they told the balanced gym owner. And, and why did they buy it in March at, as, no, the, they, as the weather was, uh, you know, warming up? 
They bought it in July, I think. They bought it in, in, over the summer and the fall. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I know that uh, Deputy Mayor Turnage uh, did um, email and, and did say that it was going to be used as a housing option. Um, but I guess the use is still to be determined, I mean, which to maybe me they, is very vague. <laughs> or maybe they changed their mind. They wanted it, they, they thought they needed a, an overnight hypothermia shelter and then they decided they didn't. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, I, but do, I really like the concept that Christian brought of of activating that outdoor area and kind of making it feel less car centric and more people centric. I think that is really a great concept. And which will be safer for everybody also. Yeah. 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 I mean, and we can look at Blagden Alley and other alleys in the area that have turned around. If you look at, if you like Google Blagden Alley 1988, there's some pictures where you're like, you would never think this would become a place that served a $20 cocktail, but yeah, so it does. Yeah, really, really. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I, I think that um, I would totally be, um, I, I think that we maybe mentioned this previously, and maybe Nancy, you brought this up as, as well at one point. I would totally be, um, having us be for having us focus on what we want the use to be mm -hmm. and that use might be like an lgbt youth yes. shelter or a senior shelter or yes. or something like those concepts that is not an everyday kind of i i say it like that it's not like a or, or a day it's for, use. It's for a special community. And yeah, I think that yes. with the Green Lantern there, I mentioned that to Brooke Pinto's office in our first meeting and they were like, they wrote it down. They yeah. scribbled it down because I do think that that's something they could potentially get funding for. Yeah. And we do not have an LGBTQ center in Ward 2 that I know of. I know there's one in, um, in Capitol Hill, but I don't think we have, other than Whitman Walker, which is more of a medical facility. Right. There is the DC Center, which is um, in, well, it's at the Reeve Center, I guess is Re Ward 1 now. You're right. Yeah, I think that's Ward 1 now. Yeah, okay. Ward 1 now. So um, anyway. Yeah, but that, that would be an option as well. I have a couple process questions. Uh, did you get a response from Deputy Mayor Turnage? Other than that, he said it's going to be used for housing, but they haven't had, they don't have a source yet. And that he would express our concerns. And he what? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Is, is that correspondence uh, available to the public? Yeah. I'm could, happy. You, could you forward it to me? I'm asking on behalf of the corporate owner yeah. of my building. Absolutely. Um, and their I'm happy to, want to see that. Sure. Uh, oops. And um, can I ask one other question unrelated to this, but just to put it on everyone's radar, uh, Commissioner Schenkel? Please. Is I, I received something from last week regarding, and we haven't been presented to about this, but there is going to be a push for an 11th Street um, bus project, like what was proposed for 7th Street. And I have received a number of concerns from my 11th Street neighbors. Uh, so just kind of putting that out there, that that is something that is being proposed to put the um, the sort of like, like on 16th Street with the red the red lanes for buses only for, on 11th Street. On 11th Street. Yes, between Pennsylvania and L. So just FYI, that came out last week, I think. Um, I am happy to copy you on that, but I do think that that's going to be something that generates some concern. Just while we were talking about it, it reminded me. Um, 
Nancy, I'm sending you two items. Um, I'm sending you the item that we sent him, um, the letter that we sent him, and I'm sending you the response. Awesome, thank you. I couldn't do it in a single That's all right. email, and I think I Not screwed it up already. I screwed it up already, so. <laughs> Oh, the letter is there. The letter you have the letter. Okay, got it. It got the letter. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Also, the architect's uh, really fabulous presentation um, as a it was yeah, quite a pro bono gift from obviously a very uh, gifted and highly placed architect. Yes. Um, but are those slides available to to you all or to? Uh, uh, we can definitely ask him to share those uh, with us. Um, at least the recording will be available. Um, okay. Of it. So, so, yes, well, we can ask him to share the slides. Again, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, my building's owner would be very interested in what the, what the vision could be that we could be part of. And Got it. Awesome. Um, if there's no other business tonight, I'd like to move that we adjourn this meeting. Second. Awesome, fabulous. I, can we stop the video? Okay. <laughs>